Okay, I'm going to answer some of the questions that were under the video of why I left Canada. A lot of thoughtful questions uh, and some, well, uh, not so much, but uh, we'll deal with them. There was a theme uh, across a number of questions, so I can eliminate uh, quite a few questions by just uh, doing a few things first. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a map, how Canadians voted in the past seven federal elections. I had said that immigrants tended to vote liberal, got some pushback on that. Uh, and um, there were a couple uh, that mentioned uh, that they were from India. One, one in particular, I remember, uh, saying 90% don't, don't want uh, Trudeau, we don't vote liberal, we're from very conservative backgrounds. Uh, probably the most conservative would probably be uh, Muslim background, you know, simply because of the nature of the religion. But we'll look at the Toronto area and we'll see how they vote. And it is a good experiment because if you're looking for uh, uh, self-segregation, uh, Toronto is a, a great case study of it. Uh, there is no reason why uh, an immigrant from India need live in Brampton, yet they do. Uh, it is, and I lived in Brampton for three years, so I am speaking from experience. I lived north of the 407, west of Mavis, uh, just by uh, Sheridan uh, at the time. Three years, I lived on a street called Woodsend Run. Now, you may hear uh, somebody say, uh, you know, there's a lot of, there's a big Indian population in Brampton. That is a uh, massive understatement. Uh, it is all Indian. So if we want to see uh, a good uh, experiment, what we can do is we can look at the Brampton writings and see how they voted in the last three elections. We can look at the Mississauga writings and see how they voted. We can look at Vaughan, we can look at Markham and Richmond Hill. Um, with the Mississauga writings, you'll get uh, the um, Muslim vote. With the Brampton writings, you'll get the uh, Indian vote. With the Markham, uh, North York uh, writings, you'll get the Chinese vote. We can see how they won. It's not as if there's 20% of the population of that cultural group. It is predominantly all. So it is a nice, clean experiment. So this is uh, how Canadians voted in the past uh, seven federal elections. And in fact, Toronto uh, as a whole uh, is a good case study because I believe it was in 2013 or 2014 where the population of Toronto uh, that was not born in Canada uh, crossed 50% for the first time, that more than 50% of the population of Toronto uh, were, not born in, uh, were not born in Canada. Uh, so we can see uh, how uh, Toronto voted. So we'll go to 2015. Uh, this is uh, when uh, the Liberals won a majority. Uh, and this is an interactive uh, chart. We can just uh, zoom in on, uh, the, uh, on Ontario. You can see uh, a lot of blue here. Uh, as you get outside of the Toronto region, uh, the demographics skew heavily uh, towards uh, European descent. In other words, uh, they are uh, more heavily uh, white dominated. Let's just zoom right into Toronto uh, and let's look at the Brampton ridings. Now, uh, this is 2015. In all fairness, Trudeau was riding a wave, but here is uh, Brampton West. Here is Brampton South. This is the riding that I lived in. And these other three are the other three Brampton ridings. Down here, you get into the Mississauga ridings, and then you get into uh, Etobicoke up here, uh, Vaughan over here. Let's just slide over here. And I want you to pay attention. We have two conservative uh, ridings here. When we get to 2021, as the Liberals went from major a majority to a minority, uh, all of these stayed Liberal, uh, and one of these even flipped to Liberal. Uh, here you have Markham, Thornhill, and uh, you have Richmond Hill uh, up here, and uh, uh, ri another uh, Richmond Hill riding. But you'll notice that Toronto is basically a liberal, uh, a liberal stronghold, and the new mayor of Toronto, uh, I think her name is Chen, I'm not really sure, uh, leans very left. Uh, leans very left. 
Let's, uh, this, this was 2015. This was, uh, you can see here, the number of seats. Uh, the Liberals got 184. You need 170 seats in, in Parliament to get a majority. The Liberals won. So it's not, not really the best example because, well, the Liberals had a majority. A lot of people voted for them. But in 2021, uh, you can see down here, uh, they had a minority. You need 170 seats. They had 159 uh, but let's just have a look at uh, how uh, that those particular writings went again because the comment was that we don't vote liberal. Uh, let's just zoom in on Brampton. And again, Brampton is a good example because it is, uh, when I lived there, it was 99.5% um, Indian, primarily from one province. Uh, these five writings up here, all liberal. Uh, there's Mississauga, all liberal. Getting into Vaughan, all liberal. Notice this uh, writing over here was conservative. Now it's flipped to liberal. Uh, all uh, liberal. Toronto, pretty much all liberal. Clean sweep right across Toronto, all uh, liberal. And again, uh, Toronto now has a population uh, of more than 50%. Uh, who were not born in Canada, and I've shown you uh, three areas uh, dominated by liberals uh, that are not just majority uh, cultural, they are almost 100% uh, the, uh, anybody from Toronto uh, or from the Toronto region or has lived in Toronto or has been through Brampton uh, knows what I mean. So that takes care of, 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 one, uh, of one aspect. Another uh, aspect that, uh, that was brought up uh, was that uh, nobody is talking about the, ta the type of taxes that I was bringing up. That, you know, uh, the increasing of the top tax rate to 56%, the bringing in a w of a wealth tax, even more taxes uh, on the wealthy. No one was talking about that. Uh, this is the NDP party. So you have to go even more left than the Liberals to get to the NDP. And for the person who said uh, we have, um, you know, a very conservative culture, this is the leader of the NDP, and uh, we'll just leave it at that. Um, this is uh, their platform. <clears throat> now, it is, hasn't been updated for a while, and I think that's good because uh, on here is its wish list. Uh, it got quite a bit of its wish list through the Liberals because uh, the NDP hold a gun with bullets in it, and they, and, and they get to fire a bullet uh, every spring. Uh, the party, uh, the ruling party, whether they have a majority government or a minority government, must table a budget. And then that budget is voted on. If the budget is voted down, that is referred to as a vote of non-confidence. And if you have a non-confidence vote, the uh, ruling party must call an election. I don't know the time period, either six months or nine months, there, but there must be an election. Usually it's a called in August and it's a September election, it's a fall election, early fall election. Um, so if they want uh, to avoid that, they need the NDP to vote with them. But the NDP has a gun with bullets in them and every bullet has a name. Um, one was $10 a day daycare. Uh, and that was, the Liberals did, did table it, put it out there, it did get voted down. Uh, so not everybody was on board with it. They did get voted down. Uh, another bullet was uh, universal dental care. Well, we just got that a little while ago. Uh, another one is universal pharmacare, and almost every political analyst uh, it will tell you expect to see that in the spring, that that, that is part of the promise to the NDP. Now, um, Trudeau doesn't have to call an election until 2025 unless his budget gets voted down in 2024, so he's got to give the NDP what they want. He's got to give them what they want, so they want that, so he'll give them that. They're going to avoid taxes because nobody's going to win an election by raising taxes, and why would they raise taxes now? Uh, they're going to avoid uh, raising the HST from 13% to 15%, but if they get reelected, expect it to go to 15%. So what we would like to do, of all the bullets the uh, NDP has, is have a look at some of the bullets they have. Because one comment was that I, you know, I was just making stuff up. That no one's talking about a wealth tax. No one's talking about raising the tax rates. Well, let's just go down. Here we are, a new deal for tax fairness. This is uh, the NDP's uh, platform uh, for taxes. So the worst outcome for Canada 
oh, well, I shouldn't say for Canada, the worst outcome for successful people. There are two that are pretty ugly. The very worst would be an NDP majority uh, or an NDP minority uh, with a coalition with the Liberals, but the NDP are in charge. That would be the worst. Uh, if you are successful in Canada at that point, I would say uh, you'd want to you'd want to leave <laughs> because you you will not see confiscation at the scale that you will see with the NDP. And and I'll even show you. Um, we'll, we'll, we can even read it. They have it written down here in black and white for us to read. Well, actually, gray and light black, but they have it here for us to read. The second worst outcome is another liberal minority. A liberal majority would be better than a liberal minority because a liberal minority, you need the NDP to prop you up again and the NDP has five bullets because you don't have to call an election for five years. You've got five budgets. They have five bullets. Uh, within a liberal majority, uh, the liberals are not likely to cut spending. They're probably likely to keep deficit spending for as far as the eye can see, but they'd be less likely to raise taxes. Not that they wouldn't, but less likely. The NDP, it would be a certainty. It would, it would be, if the NDP had a majority, it would be day one. Day one would, would, would be taxes are going up. First budget, taxes, all of it would be going up. The worst, the worst outcomes are either NDP majority or minority and liberal minority. Uh, if the Conservatives win, they are uh, less likely to raise taxes. Less likely. Doesn't mean they won't, but they're less likely. Liberals would be more likely. NDP would be absolutely. As far as spending, Liberals are least, uh, sorry, the, the Conservatives would be least likely to increase spending. I don't know if they'd cut it. Liberals would be likely to increase spending and uh, NDP oh, absolutely would increase spending because the NDP doesn't believe we have a spending problem. They believe we have a revenue problem. So let's have a look at the potential bullets that the uh, NDP could have in their gun if you get another liberal minority. And we'll just, we'll just look at some of the language here just so that you can get a feel uh, for how they speak. Uh, the the uh, message sometimes is in the rhetoric. Uh, we can say things in a number of ways. How we choose to say things says a lot about what we're trying to say without actually saying it. This uh, second paragraph, I think, is a crime. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, talked about inequalities to begin with, and we must just accept that those inequalities are, are, are a function of the system and not a function of free choice, by the way. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic has driven these inequalities even deeper. While millions of families and small businesses have been pushed to the brink during the pandemic, let me stop right there, who pushed them to the brink? Did successful people push them to the brink? No, the government shut everything down. The government pushed them to the brink. Can't blame successful people for that. I can, I can recall quite a few business leaders at the time were saying, this is ridiculous. Successful people were saying, don't do this. The government did it anyways. And who's going to take the blame? Successful people. They take the blame in the next sentence. The super rich are doing better than ever. First of all, there is no super rich. There are super experienced people, not super rich. I have lots of market experience. Uh, when uh, the central bank stepped in, uh, during the pandemic to flood the market. Uh, you can go back to my YouTube channel and have a look. I put out a whole bunch of videos saying, do not short this market. This is a gift for us. Stand in the way. Buy whatever you can. Do not short this market. How do I know that? I got experience. So the experience and the government actions made me wealthy. I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't shut the economy down. I didn't flood the economy with money. I had experience. So in that moment, I'm not super rich, I'm super experienced. What did you want me to do? Nothing, right? If you put two people in a room, one with experience and one with money, it won't be long before the person with the experience has the money and the person who had the money now has experience. That's just the way experience works. But no, they don't say experienced people who, who knew what to do did very well. The super rich are doing better. So they set up this, this situation where all these people are doing so bad and look at what the super rich did, trying to make it the super rich fault. It's the government's fault. It is 100% the government's fault. Canadian billionaires are $78 billion richer since the first lockdown and counting. 
They're making big money while people suffer. It's scandalous, and it's time to put a stop to it. Vilifying success. You're vilifying experience. There, they understand this. There are no rich people. There are successful people. Successful people happen to be rich because that's the measure of success. There are no rich. You want to find rich people? They're lottery winners. They are lottery winners where it's nothing but pure luck. There's no hard work in winning a lottery. Those are rich people. Everyone else is successful. They are successful. But, you know, not using the right words, this, this is the rhetoric that, grow, that is growing in Canada on the left. And the liberals do embrace this rhetoric as well. This is the rhetoric that's growing. We believe that those who have profited off the pandemic should be the ones to pay for the recovery. I agree with that. All those people who stole pandemic benefits through fraud, through outright lying, through theft, all of those people who profited off the pandemic should be the one to pay for it. I agree. Not families who are struggling to make ends meet. Who says they're paying for it? It's time to demand that the wealthiest pay their share. Notice the rhetoric here. You start off with those who profited, not these people, and then you go over to the wealthy. Those who profited, not these, these. Implying that the wealthiest are the ones that did it, are the ones that are making all this money off the back of the poor working families. The rhetoric, the rhetoric. It's time to demand that the wealthiest pay their share so we can build a better future for everyone. Uh, let's just keep going to what they want to do. No one should be profiteering during a global health crisis when so many Canadians are suffering and need help more than ever. Suffering because of what the government did now. New Democrats will introduce a temporary COVID-19 excess profit tax that puts an additional 15% tax on large corporate windfall profits during the pandemic. I don't know how you're going to measure that. We'll go after large corporations that took public, publicly funded COVID-19 wage subsidies and turned around and paid out executive bonuses. Okay, okay, for that, I think, you know what, if, you, if you're a company and you took a bunch of, of, of government uh, uh, money to keep people on, on salary, maybe, maybe the optics of paying yourself a bonus was a little bit stupid that maybe you should have thought of that, right? Um, let's see. Uh, it says here, executed stock buybacks or paid shareholder dividends. I don't know that I would go as far as to say paid shareholder dividends because a lot of the dividend-paying companies uh, in Canada are held by pension funds. Uh, uh, and if, and, and what, what they're basically saying at this point is that, you shouldn't have, that these companies should not have provided income to, to, uh, uh, to pension funds. So this is, this is where you get economic inexperience and financial inexperience saying stuff they don't understand, but just saying stuff, right? To make our tax system fair, ensure the wealthiest individuals are paying their fair share. Who says we're not? 53.5% tax rate, 20% luxury tax rate. Who says we're not paying our fair share? At what point, at, so what they're saying is the rates that we're paying are still not fair, that they would be higher right? Uh, we will increase the capital gains inclusion rate to 75%, not 50%, 75%. Well, you know what you'll do? You'll disincentivize a lot of investment. But I don't think they understand that because, well, they don't understand how wealth creation in an economy works. If you're going to create wealth in an economy, you're going to have to accept that some people are going to get very wealthy on that. It's a Pareto distribution. The only way to raise the level of the Pareto distribution is to accept that some people will get very wealthy. Uh, we will also boost the top marginal tax rate two points because 53.53 is not high enough. Let's go to 55.53. If I were a corporation, if I were a corporation because I pay 53.53% tax, I would be a, minor, a minority shareholder. If I, as an individual, were a corporation, I would be a minority shareholder in my own life because of these tax rates. I am basically a minority shareholder. And what did we learn in CFA Level 2 with minority shareholders? They are people who have influence but no control. I would have influence but no control. Two more points. Two more points and get rid of the, the, the benefit of the capital gains. Put in place a luxury good tax, goods tax on yachts and private jets. Well, what is your definition of a yacht, right? We already have 
uh, a luxury tax on boats over a certain price. We already have a luxury tax on cars over 100000 and ask the very richest multimillionaires to pay a bit more towards our shared services with a wealth tax. For somebody who said, we're not even talking about a wealth tax, there's a bullet out there with all these taxes on it, and you got five budgets coming up if the Liberals get a, min a minority government in 2025 propped up by the NDP. One of those bullets is going to be taxes. There's your wealth tax right there. The number that they've... Uh, Floated before is 10 million. Anything above 10 million, you're going to pay 2% on. The leader of the NDP, Jagmeet Singh, has an estimated net worth of about 6 million. Interesting that he chose a number higher than where he would have to pay. You see, this is, this is a, a, a classic move on the left. Is they're super, super generous with other people's resources, but not theirs. Why didn't he say 5 million? because then he would have had to pay an extra $20,000 a year. So, oh, can't be $5 million because I have $6 million. Got to make it $10 million. Can't be seven because I may eventually get to seven with my six. It's got to be a number far enough away. Let's make it 10. Think about that. Right? So, they are being discussed. Now, one more thing before we go. This is a, an interesting story. It just came out today, December 29th, 4 a.m. Existing, uh, exiting MPs. Uh, share their views on the state of politics toxic atmosphere because somebody had uh, left a comment of oh, well you're throwing a little temper tantrum like a child why didn't you change that you were why didn't you organize community do community development do this do that run for office why didn't you do any of that which really is requiring me to really just change my whole life in order to change my life it doesn't make any sense but talks about uh, how things used to be here uh, and uh, let's get to, to, to some quotes here. Uh, this person, Liebert, who was announced, uh, who announced in February he won't be seeking re-election, has been involved in politics since the 70s, first as a journalist covering the Alberta legislature and eventually joining the provincial government as Premier Peter Lougheed's press secretary. Uh, first elected as a uh, PC conservative uh, in, in 2004, serving two terms, won his federal seat, uh, for the Conservatives in 2015. Since that time, he says he's seen a dramatic change in who is seeking public office. You had a real good mix of business people. You had advocates. I don't think we're getting that anymore, he said. What we're seeming to find is we have, and I think it's uh, all uh, in all political parties, you've got a lot of, and it says in brackets, former, former young staffers who are now members of Parliament. That's not to say they're not good members of Parliament, but I don't think they bring the broad range of experience that you used to see in cabinets in caucus 10, 20 years ago. Uh, we've got people who are doing very well financially, have a good life. They just don't want to give that up for this constant seeing your name dragged through the mud on a constant basis. It's really unfortunate because the whole country suffers as a result. Democracy suffers. It's just sad. That's exactly it. Why the hell would I ever want to give up what I have to run for this dog and pony show? to run in, in, in a popularity contest just to have my name dragged through shit every day and I would have to drag other people's name through shit every day because that's where we are. Why the hell would I ever want to get involved in that? Why would any good person ever want to run for public office given the state of politics, both in Canada and the U.S.? It's just a clown show, and I'm not going to be part of a clown show. Okay. Let's, uh, let's answer some questions now. Okay, for those of you uh, new to the way I do things, when I uh, go through the comments section and answer, I have a blank screen here so that I can uh, write or draw things out if I have to, uh, to explain things. So that's what that's there for. Uh, this started with a quote, when you don't agree with the government, what do you do? You vote. I said that. What if voting doesn't work? You leave, right? Um, Somebody then said, actually sounds like an incredibly dumb point to make. Uh, there are a million things you could, should do before you have a temp temper tantrum like a child on the playground and go home. I wonder if this person disagrees with me. Have a temper tantrum like a child and go home. And then list some of the things that I can do. Political advocacy, advocacy, lobbying grassroots organizations and education, policy enactment through media and organized programs, getting directly involved. 
That is uh, a, a, a basically change of life. That is me saying, okay, I'm dropping everything and I'm going to dive into this. Now, if I do that, there is a 100% probability that I lose what I have because I got to give it up. But there is a low probability that what I do will be successful. Or let's say it another way, there is a 100% probability of downside and less than a 100% probability of upside. In the finance industry, we call that an asymmetrical bet uh, to the downside. You are a fool if you take an asymmetrical bet where, where your losses are 200 bucks, but your gains can only be 20 bucks. That's an asymmetrical payoff. You'd be a fool to take that bet. So I would be a fool to take that. Not only that, I don't want to get involved in this filthy little game of politics. It's dirty, it's filthy, it's ugly, and it's people I have zero respect for. The whole democratic system is broken. We don't elect qualified people anymore. We elect popular people. These are popularity contests. That's all. That's all they are. We elect wholly unqualified people. Uh, so we get statements like we read from uh, the NDP. We get statements that, that show a general lack of understanding of how investment in an economy works and who makes investment. So I think we can uh, do away with that one now. Let's uh, go on to some, uh, some interesting questions. Uh, as a fellow Canadian, I agree with all your points. However, I would be curious to know at a high level what your ideal version of government in Canada would be in terms of policy uh, and taxation. Uh, cut spending where? Tax who? More spending in what areas? I myself live abroad and have voted conservative, but alas. I should point out I vote conservative because I can't vote liberal. Not because, I, not because I'm not a liberal, but because I can't vote for the current version of liberalism. Liberalism have shift, has shifted so far left to the point of ridiculousness, I simply can't get on board with that. I am a classical liberal. That is a classical liberal. You can Google that to see what that is. It is socially liberal, which is what a liberal is, but fiscally conservative. In other words, you do whatever you want. You do you, I'll do me, dress the way you want, act the way you want, talk the way you want, be who you want, be, who, be with who you want, look the way you want. I don't care. Just don't send me the bill. That's all. All I'm asking is you don't send me the bill for your lifestyle choices and I won't send you the bill for my lifestyle choices. We will each do our own thing and I'm good with that. Uh, in the 90s, I voted for Jean Chrétien. Uh, uh, yeah, sorry, Jean Chrétien. Um, and I like Paul Martin. Uh, good businessman with a good background. Uh, but it's in the last 10 to 15 years that the, the liberal turn to the left, dramatically to the left, uh, they have gone to a point where I can't go. So I'm not a conservative, really, when we look at the ideology. It's just I can't vote liberal. I, I can't vote liberal anymore. I wish that the Liberal Party would return more towards the center because <clears throat> they were rational. If you go back to the 70s and the 80s, uh, the conservatives were, eh, who wants to vote for Joe Clark? I mean, yeah, he did win a minority government, but... Uninspiring. Nobody really was. I mean, the conservatives were nothing. It was. It's really the liberals. Uh, but today, the conservatives are seen as a, a a a welcome alternative to what liberals are. I just want to get that out of the way. Uh, what do I think it, it would be? Uh, a couple of things that you could do right away. Number one, uh, there should be. Uh, it should be part of the law that you have to pa that you have to pass a balanced operational budget, a balanced operational budget, uh, because you have operations and you have CapEx, okay? CapEx is investment in infrastructure like building a port or building high-speed rail uh, or, or widening highways. Okay, well, that's investment in infrastructure that increases the productivity of the assets. That I can see using debt for. There's where you would want to do some deficit spending uh, by I issuing debt for stuff like that. But an operational budget, you must pass a balanced operational budget. If a company uh, were borrowing money to fund its operations, uh, it would be a prime target for short selling because that is unsustainable. That company will eventually die if you're, if you're borrowing money just to finance your operations. 
if you're if you have to if you need money to finance your operations because you're growing that's where equity financing comes in that's where venture capital comes in but if you're borrowing money uh, just to pay your bills at some point you're going to hit a wall there should be there should be a law balanced operational budget and then capex and much like we have a central bank that determines monetary policy we should have an independent call it a treasury if you want independent treasury that approves the balanced operational budget it should not go for a vote on the floor it should not go for a vote on the floor because that's where you get all of the stuff that has to go in to get everybody's vote it should be approved by an independent board much like the central bank is part of government but separate this would be part of government but separate it says okay you bring us a balanced operational budget we will approve it we'll say okay that passes it's approved it's done and then uh, you can determine what type of capex makes sense for canada the other thing that i would do if we look at education uh, there are private schools there are private schools that you can send your kids to you can homeschool you can homeschool as well uh, 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 so education has that right but when it comes to your body your own personal body nope sorry you must take the public option there is only the public option there is no private option you can't have a private option along with a public option for something as important as your own body you don't have a choice that if you're going to have universal health care have a private system as well why because I'd be willing to pay for it and if I'm willing to pay for it I would take pressure off the public system which would lower costs on the public system it would become more efficient it would actually lower costs by giving me the opportunity to buy private health care so when I need private health care you know what I do I just go to the US I can go to the US there's a big medical tourism industry we're losing money to the US anyways why the hell wouldn't you have a private system you allow it for school and that's less important than your body think about that for a second so those are two things that I would put into place right away is I'd say why not just go with balanced operational budgets and why not introduce a private uh, a private option on top of the public option thank you done I would do that do you see yourself staying in Costa Rica the majority of the year yeah I think so hop around like spend a few months here and there throughout the year not yet I still have a lot of work to do uh, I'm still very active in uh, the CFA space mostly at level three now and I have the applied level which uh, is going to take several years to build out to the vision that I have for it uh, you can't be hopping around uh, when you when you're trying to focus because every time you hop somewhere there's an adjustment period and you have to stabilize the place that you're at because you get there and you say okay well this is broken that's broken this needs to be fixed I can't live with this I can't live with that that has to go you two three weeks where you're tied up with something I can't afford that uh, to lose that kind of time uh, let's see regarding the analogy with students and exams in the university when you frame the problem in a university class it absolutely makes sense and how much effort the student will put in when I draw a parallel for individuals with taxes not so straightforward so when I when I uh, uh, gave an example uh, of uh, you know using equities and how the distribution uh, the return on equities the middle of the distribution uh, or the center of the distribution would drift downwards uh, and then I said okay well let's flip it over uh, into let's just change some words uh, the key the key thing when you flip it over is it invokes a behavioral change okay it's not just and we're going to see this question later on is that uh, uh, it makes sense when you talk equities but when you go to social programs it doesn't make sense it's because you when you do it with a, a social program it, it invokes behavioral changes that's the important thing that's what changes the distribution is the behavioral uh, uh, change and and this question is saying listen you know uh, you have the bottom decile and you have the top decile and then you have this big fat middle and he's saying okay I get that there'll be behavioral changes down here and I get that maybe higher taxes will be deter people in there but what about this middle part of the distribution um, well for this we have to introduce the Pareto distribution to understand uh, how 10 percent is pretty much everything that the top 10 percent is pretty much everything uh, a Pareto distribution looks like this okay so uh, this is uh, um, a distribution of almost anything where uh, it would have percent let's say 100 percent of a, of a population of any given population uh, you can take hockey players 
for example. <clears throat> and a, they follow a Pareto distribution. And you can look at the number of goals. And all the goals scored throughout history, and you can look at the top 10% uh, will have probably scored 50% uh, of all the goals, uh, sometimes all the way to about 80% of all the goals. Uh, look at all the artists, uh, musical artists through history, and look at the top 10% uh, in terms of um, number of songs sold. They will probably account for 70% of the industry's uh, revenues. <clears throat> uh, every, lots of things follow a Pareto distribution uh, and things that aren't related to money. Lots of things follow a Pareto distribution. It's a natural distribution to see. Yet somehow when it comes to money, we're all shocked, shocked that there is this type of distribution. Well, there it is right there. That is the behavior you do not want changed. That behavior right there is what you do not want changed. Because if you change this behavior, you see how this curve uh, uh, has a certain amount of elevation. If you change this behavior, what you will get is something that, that is much lower. In other words, there will not be the opportunity. The reason this curve is at this level, we think, oh my God, look how low it is compared to here. That is not low. That is being pulled up by, these, by this group of people. It is being pulled up. If you eliminate or change the behavior of the top 10%, what you do is you change the very nature of the environment in which the opportunity for performance down here is provided. There's an old expression that if you don't like rich people, go work for a poor person. Tell me how that works out for you. Imagine an economy where everybody earns uh, 50000 a year. Imagine an economy where no matter what you earned, it was taken away from you until you were down to 50% and it was evened out across everybody so that everybody had an equal outcome. And an entrepreneur comes along and says, Eureka, I found it, the cure for cancer. I need $20 million and I can, I can get this ready to go. And nobody has investment. Why? Because nobody has money. Because nobody has savings. Savings equal investment. Without these people and their massive savings, you don't have investment. Sometimes you need people with a critical mass of money to make those kind of investments. Now, if that investment was made, it does create employment. It creates employment opportunities for everyone else. But you get rid of, in, of, of that top 10%. You change the behavior up there. You change significant levels of saving, which means you change significant levels of investment. What you need to replace my lost taxes in Canada is this. If you were going to replace me with people who earn 60000 a year, that is the average income in Canada. If you replace me with people who earn 60, their effective tax rate somewhere around, let's say, 33%. So you'll get 20 k in tax uh, for that. You need 65 of these people to replace one of me. 65 of these to replace the tax base that is lost. But what is lost is more important. None of these 65 earning 60,000 are going to be in a position to either donate to charity or invest in somebody's business. I am. You lose that. You come up with an idea, you have an audience of 65, and everyone says, nice idea, but I, I don't have the money for this. I do. I do. And now that's gone. That's what happens when you affect this part of the distribution. It changes the rest of the distribution for everyone because it changes the very environment in which they find themselves wherever they happen to be. You want to see an economy do very terrible, kick the top 10% of performers out, say you and your capital get the hell out of here and watch what happens. So it does not matter what the middle of the distribution does. The middle of the distribution is where they are primarily because of the top of the distribution. In case you think that I'm just making that up, for anybody who is an athlete, for anybody who's been in sports, for anybody who has uh, uh, run races, played hockey, played soccer, played football, uh, have uh, been in uh, judo, martial arts, boxing, Tell me that the better, stronger person doesn't make you try harder. Tell me that the faster person doesn't make you dig deeper. If you're a swimmer, tell me that the person in front of you doesn't make you dig deeper. 
tell me that it doesn't. Any athlete will tell you it is the presence of the superstars that make me reach higher. Take away all of them and you don't have, you don't have that person in front of you that, you that you push just a little harder to get to. Take away successful people in an economy, you lose your role models. And they are role models. They are not to be spit on. Spit on your politicians. Celebrate successful people. Don't demonize them. You celebrate them. They're role models. They're meant to be emulated. But, but if you, if you uh, are an athlete, you know exactly what I mean. If you, if you go to a gym, if you're into weightlifting, you go to the gym and you're pushing weights, the presence, being in the gym and seeing other people lifting more, lifting heavier, doing an extra set, an extra three sets more than you, pushes you to do better yourself. You'll always do better in competition against when, when, when you measure yourself against uh, people who are stronger, faster, better than if you just run by yourself. Because no one's pushing you. No one's pushing you. So you do need these people. Uh, so uh, I don't think that we even have to worry uh, about, the, uh, about the middle. We do have to worry about our most successful people because they are our most experienced people. They are our most qualified people. Uh, would you be uh, in more in favor of a tax system like the Netherlands where you start paying 49.5 uh, when you're in 75K a year? Uh, the argument here is uh, it's high. You reach it sooner, everybody pays it, and it doesn't get any bigger than that. No, I, I don't think I'd be in favor uh, of that. I, I see nothing wrong with a progressive tax system. I really don't. Uh, but there should be some maximum upper limit that politicians cannot mess with. Uh, but to keep pushing higher and higher and higher and higher. It's an easy target because we don't vote for these parties. Successful people don't vote, but when you have a Pareto distribution and you are running on a populist platform of the wealthy are to blame, there's a lot more votes here than there are here. So it is, it is, we're an easy target because we're not, we're not a large enough group to change a, to change a vote. So we become an easy target. No, I wouldn't be uh, in agreement with that. Uh, also, you cannot compare uh, the Northern European countries like Sweden, Norway, Denmark, or the Netherlands, you can't compare them with other countries. You can't compare them with Canada, US, UK, France. Maybe you can compare them with, with Japan. There is one thing that those countries have in common uh, that Canada, US, France, UK, countries like that lack. Uh, they have uh, still the most cohesive populations uh, uh, in in the developed uh, world. Cohesive meaning that they have the least amount of uh, uh, or the lowest level uh, of immigration. Um, I shouldn't say the lowest level of immigration, but if you look at the demographics of the population, they are very cohesive, predominantly white, predominantly Northern Euro European. If you are going to say things like, we are all in this together, you need a sense of community. Uh, there is a much tighter sense of community when everyone is like you. And that's not uh, saying anything uh, negative. That is just simply uh, a statement uh, from social psychology. Any social psychologist will tell you in-group versus out-group is a very real thing. You can't ignore it. That the more uh, diver diverse uh, a uh, population gets, the more divided a population gets, especially at level, especially when you start talking about social systems, the more divisive it gets. That at the level of the whole, uh, uh, diversity is actually a weakness. And it's a weakness that can be exploited, and we do see it being exploited. Foreign interference uh, can, can take a divided society and divide them even more. If you really want to split a, a country apart from the inside, uh, a very multicultural country is ripe for division. Uh, those kind of things wouldn't work here if you're trying to get communal things like that, simply because there is that lack of, in, in, uh, of, of, of community from in-group. Uh, you would need a politician who's a centrist, who has a way of bringing the country together. We don't have that. We have divisive politics, hence we have divisive populations. That's, you know, it flows down like that, right? Uh, I know from previous videos you don't have wife, kids, and many friends left in Canada as you were focused on building your own company. How would your choice differ were you to include the social sentimental variables in the equation? Well, you know, it's hard to say how it would differ. 
Um, uh, if you have if you have family, then it, you know it's it's much more difficult to uproot them, <coughs> especially if if family is a very important thing to you, and you have that network there. Then yeah, it's uh, it's it's one of those things where you say well. Uh, they're your rocks, but they're also your anchors at the same time. It's like, well, I can't go um, because of this. I mean, you could, but it's not that you shouldn't use the word can't. It's that you won't go because, because you have um, obligations in that sense. Um, it's not for everyone. Uh, it really isn't. If you're making $70,000 a year in Canada and, and you have a family there, this, is, this kind of move wouldn't be worth it for you. Uh, you are not at the level uh, where you really have to worry about things. Uh, you're not there. Um, my projection is over the next five years while I'm here, I will save, and I'll write the number down for you, $13 million in taxes. $13 million. So it, it, that basically works out to $2.6 million a year on average. If I said to you, listen, I'll pay you $2.6 million a year to go live in a tropical country for the next five years, would you do it? Would you do it? Right? Um, I know from previous videos you give away the majority of your wealth to charitable organizations. Actually, the uh, in my will, what is named is a university, uh, one single university, uh, and the funds are uh, for a research chair, <clears throat> a significant research chair, uh, so that uh, in finance. Uh, but yeah, it is uh, to a particular university. Um, why bother to leave Canada and pay less tax if you don't have any children that you would like to pass them on as much as possible from your effort? Uh, and as I said in the follow-up to this video, which was why I chose Costa Rica, it's just a question of fairness. And for me, I'm at that point in life where I, where I say, listen, it's a big world. You know, I, I, I've hardly seen any of it. It's a big world. I want to experience more than just my little corner uh, in Ontario. Uh, so it's it kind of came along, the idea kind of came along at the right time where I said, not only can I just avoid these taxes, but I can leave a country in which I simply disagree with the politics of the country. Now, this is every generation. Every generation feels that way. There'll be another comment later on that says, you know, uh, I know somebody uh, who's a good person but feels out of place because of the way politics has shifted. Uh, you will too. When you get to a certain age, you will feel as if, uh, you know, the landscape has shifted to a point where you don't recognize things anymore and you don't agree with it. Well, you're leaving the stage anyways, right? So I can, I can sort of sit back and say, well, listen, I don't like these policies, but they keep winning. Sure, it's a minority government, but they keep winning. So uh, that must be what Canadians want. I believe, you know, if, if democracy is what democracy is, majority rules, I do believe the majority does rule, period. Uh, well, they're not a majority, they're minority, but with another party they form a majority. If this is what people want today, it's not what I want, but if it's what they want, then I should just get out of the way, right? And that doesn't mean shut up and sit down. And we're just going to take stuff from you and you're just going to sit there and take it. No, 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 no. There's still a notion of fairness. Getting out of the way means I'm leaving. But, and if you are from Northern Ontario, you will get this reference immediately. In leaving, I am taking my net and my puck with me. Uh, let's go to the uh, next one. Uh, just wanted to know if there are any specific reasons for choosing Costa Rica. I did a follow-up video the very next day of why I chose Costa Rica. I personally had a social argument. We are not born equal. Uh, and the normal asymmetric distribution you establish for returns per asset class uh, could be applied to you at potential birth. That's true. That's true. All uh, characteristics of an individual, uh, all are pretty much normally distributed. Not only uh, you might be born more or less gifted than average, uh, but how much you'll uh, make this potential uh, grow will depend on parents, family, and life circumstances. Uh, well, I'm not going to say that there is nothing there, but I'm going to say that it is not necessary. Not that there's not that not that it doesn't help, but that it is not necessary because I had none of that. I had none of that motivation in life as well as the capacity to elevate yourself, also comes from the conditions you have to support your own growth. And this compounds too. 
Imagine if in one family, in a particular generation, someone takes bad decisions. It will compound on the education, potentially, from one generation to it. Why would it, why, why would it, why would it affect my grandmother? I grew up with a grandmother. I didn't have parents. My grandmother made some poor decisions about how she conducted her life. Didn't affect my education. I'm, I'm not sure how, how a, a bad choice by your parent would affect your, your, uh, your, your education. Uh, things can slip and get worse, and as things slip, parents uh, are less and less likely to provide good success clues to their own children. Eh, well, okay, okay. Uh, if you're if you're going with the nurture argument, um, I, I'm pretty sure that argument has been solved. The nature uh, versus nurture, uh, and um, I, I do remember reading quite a few years ago that that um, with meta there was a meta analysis done on it that nature is the winner. Uh, over nurture, uh, but you're 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 bringing the nurture argument in. I'm not going to say there's nothing there. It does have an effect, sure. Uh, uh, I think it can, uh, but an interaction effect. I don't think it it is its own effect. I think it has an interaction effect. Uh, so you have the individual, and then you have the individual embedded in an environment, uh, and there is an interaction uh, between the environment and the individual. There's your nature, and here's your nurture uh, in here. Uh, the nature of an individual can overcome nurture or the nature of the individual uh, might not be pulled up by nurture. I've known people who've had every opportunity in life that have gone absolutely nowhere. So we can say uh, that there is a distribution all over the place when it comes to this, that if you are born in a situation uh, where, the, uh, uh, where you don't have what other people have, um, that you may not uh, get to where they are. <laughs> That, that assumes that people who are born into these other, this, these other situations, these good situations, have those, have those beneficial qualities. Uh, I've known people who had every chance in the world, every opportunity, and went nowhere. And uh, I've seen some people who you should have bet against who succeeded. Uh, if I just gave you a description, uh, here's a child who was born to an 18-year-old mother uh, who left abandoned the child to a grandmother, an alcoholic grandmother, uh, who uh, was not wealthy, who was quite poor uh, overall. Um, what are the chances for that kid? Uh, would you say uh, that he'd end up being a PhD and a multimillionaire? Because that's me, right? I mean, uh, background. You got to look at the background. Nobody wants to hear your backstory, right? Nobody wants to hear your backstory they want to just assume your backstory based on what you look like and where you are and then just say, oh, well, you don't understand. No, I understand. Believe me, I understand. <laughs> I do. Uh, and, and it didn't affect me, really, you know, uh, uh, but I had certain characteristics. And again, you can find somebody from a better off family who might have fewer characteristics than me and stand less of a chance. So... You know, when we say that, that, uh, that, that you know, uh, you have situations where people may lack certain things, uh, humans are, if anything, extremely adaptable. Uh, the, 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 you can't, I don't know that you can just point to environment and say, you know, this is it. You really do have to point to the individual, and the individual, I think, has an interaction with the environment, but I don't think the individual can be determined by the environment. Not, not in countries like Canada and the US where there is opportunity. Uh, I think in other countries where there are social impediments, uh, there are some countries where if you're born into a particular class of citizen, a lot of opportunities are simply closed to you. There, there, I will stand with those people and say, listen, they don't even have a chance. But if, 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 if you're complaining about uh, your opportunities in Canada and the U.S., I think a lot of that's got to be on you because you, you have the real potential to be as successful as you want to be regardless of where you start. Uh, let's see. Even though I agree with your political argument, isn't it be better to be more on the bright side of the equation? Yeah. You know, there was one book I read, uh, Dweck, uh, Caroline Dweck. She's uh, all into this uh, idea of uh, the, the growth mindset. 
right? Uh, I'm sure you've heard of this one. And in her book, she says, that, you know, given given cognitive ability or not, I'll take cognitive ability. Thank you very much. You know, so she was even in that she was saying, listen, given given the choice of being born with all these gifts, I'll take that. Thank you very much. Uh, is it better to be born on the bright side of the equation? Yeah. But what if you're not? You see, you can create your own equation. So I was born on the wrong side of the equal sign. That doesn't matter. I can get to the other side of the equal sign if, if I have role models, if I have exemplars, if I have people that I can look at and say, how did you do it? But if you scare all the successful people away and demonize them, where are my role models? How do I, how do, I do better when we keep slapping success in the face and saying, no, not you. You sit down and shut up. I don't know. Anyways, uh, isn't it fair to pay a price to be to support uh, for those who got less potential, less mental strength, less motivation? Uh, no, the less motivation. No, I wouldn't say. I wouldn't say less. I wouldn't say. Uh, it, it, let's support somebody who has less motivation. If you have less motivation, that's on you. Uh, less mental strength, you mean less cognitive ability? There's always, uh, you know, sure. I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm nowhere near saying everybody should get a PhD. There are some people that that's, that, that is simply not, uh, uh, not their strength in life. But I think we're going too far away from the points that I was trying to make and too, too deep into uh, social things. Let's just, we'll just move on here. I think I made my point there. Uh, working in finance, uh, what advice uh, would you have for us that have an expectation of high human capital uh, with many high earning years to come? Should we relocate and restart our careers? Well, uh, no, no, I wouldn't say that. Uh, first of all, relocating. If you move to Costa Rica, you would not be facing uh, uh, future years of high income, right? Uh, it is, unless unless you have the ability uh, to earn an income regardless of your geography. That was me. I could earn an income regardless of my geography. <clears throat> so for me, it was a great opportunity. For many people, it is not an option. That if you do want to have high earnings potential, you kind of have to be in the middle of a developed economy. But that does not mean you have to have to take the highest tax rates. You can choose different tax, uh, different tax jurisdictions. In Canada, Alberta, Saves you 5% right away. Uh, if, if it's a possibility for you to be in Alberta in different states in the U.S., it is possible there. But in the end, uh, you are uh, uh, sort of uh, almost a prisoner to the country that you're in, an economic prisoner uh, to the country that you're in. Uh, so, no, it's, it's what I did worked for me. That does not mean it works for everyone. So... What would you do if you were in our shoes? I'd pretty much stay where I was. If, if I had to rely on a company for uh, income, then I'd pretty much stay where I was. I, I pretty much would have no choice. I'd have to say, well, you know, here I am. What can I do? I left the UK 13 years ago. Fell into it uh, by finding work in places like Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo, instead of actively disapproving governance and policy. I never found a reason to go back as a permanent resident. Hmm. Agree with your views on Canada, and this argument makes a lot of sense, but what about things that are harder to quantify, such as family, friends, relationships? Well, yeah, uh, that, is, uh, that is a thing. Uh, I didn't have them, you know, so it, for me it was, it was an easier decision to make. Um, if I had family, I don't, I, I, I think I, st and if I were still in this position, I, I think I might still be entertaining the idea. Uh, if, if there was a way, if there was a pathway, I'd, I'd probably be investigating to see if there was a pathway. And if there wasn't, I would, it's, I'd be saying, well, what do we all think about Calgary? Uh, lots of good skiing. It's a nice province. Anybody want to go to Calgary? And if that still wasn't an option, then you shrug your shoulders and you say, oh, well, oh, well. Here I am. Uh, what tax strategies have I got? Uh, and real estate is usually a good way to get a lot of good uh, uh, tax shields because you get the depreciation tax shield, you get the interest tax shield. And if you hold a building for five years and sell it, you should be able to generate a, an income tax loss 
on the building which can offset some of your income but you'd have to roll that sale into the next property into the next into the next but there are ways uh, uh, there are ways to do it I would have just said oh well I guess this is what I'll have to do and do the best I can uh, one difference I can think of on top of my head is the population growth present in a country as opposed to a company uh, more people act as consumers of its own system, plus additional taxpayers. They're forced to consume and spend within the system, whereas companies don't really have an option. Imagine a company that increase, could increase payroll, but they are forced to only buy company product. What would you say uh, to this point? How would you address it? Um, I'm, I'm not sure um, I made a country company analogy. I, I made a... Uh, a, an analogy with um, choosing equities and, and trying to present, protect yourself from the equity market in general. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't know that I made that analogy. Uh, no. And one of the most interesting is how you know from a logical standpoint change in behavior. Do you know any other ways to change the behavior of a group through other methods and tools? Economics has the answer for that. And, and, and there are uh, two, set, two, um, uh, two outcomes, right? And, and to put it very uh, uh, simply, it's uh, sticks versus carrots. Sticks versus carrots, right? So uh, they're incentives. Uh, this is a disincentive. And this is an incentive. So if we want to uh, have certain behavior, we provide incentives. If we want to discourage certain behavior, we provide disincentives. But it seems with the uh, way that uh, society has been drifting, uh, that we look at disincentives and we say, oh, it's not fair to have these disincentives in place. It only, uh, it only punishes the... Uh, um, I guess we'll call them the oppressed people or, or the oppressed groups, uh, the marginalized groups. Disincentives uh, are disproportionately affect them, so we uh, keep removing disincentives. Uh, and we seem to uh, not worry too much about incentives. But uh, economics will tell you if you want a particular type of behavior, incentivize it. If you want to discourage a certain type of behavior, disincentivize it. Sticks versus carrots. That's it. Uh, that's really it. How could one change behavior for himself? Is there any other way? Well, it's not a matter of restricting free choice. It's using your free choice uh, to, to uh, achieve more optimal outcomes, right? It, it, it's, if, you, if you just can't make good decisions... Uh, then restricting your free choice is the way to go, but it's just a matter of uh, opening up your mind to what what choices do I have? And most people don't recognize that they have lots of choices uh, uh, available to them. Uh, so it's the first thing is determining, when you say change your behavior, the first thing is to determine what for. You know, what do you... When you, if you're saying, what can I do to change my behavior, you're almost implicitly saying, I don't like what I'm doing, or I don't like the outcomes that I have, or I don't like where I am. What can I do to change uh, my behavior? Uh, that's a whole, that's a whole a series of videos on, on, on uh, uh, you know, changing your behavior. I would say the, the best advice that I can give here is micro changes and a lot of them micro not big macro changes but micro changes little things you do every day but every single day every single day a little a little a little change here a little change here a little change there uh, and uh, that ends up being big changes later on but you first have to figure out where it is you want to go uh, and if you don't know where it is you want to go you you at least should have to figure it out well if i don't know where i'm going how do i want to go down whatever path that i'm going down so uh, there are a lot of questions. I don't know if I'll get through all of them because I don't want this to be like a five-hour video, but I'll just keep going. Oh, we've already, uh, I've already touched upon this one here. This is the person saying, my friend is my age, but his father was 50-something and, and uh, saying, you know, good guy and everything, but, uh, you know, finds himself looking at society today and saying, eh, I'm unimpressed. 
Yeah, that is that is the story of generation after generation, going all the way back a thousand years ago, uh, when some sixty-year-old guy looked at his son and said, "A oh, windmill? You're wasting your why?" In my day, we pounded the millet with our feet. Well, a windmill, you know, going all the way back to that. Uh, I can remember when I was growing up and I was a teenager. It's the video games and. The video games are creating uh, 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 murderers <laughs> or whatever it is. The video games are rotting kids' minds. This and, you know, all of uh, that was the whole thing. It was like, it wasn't. I mean, I was a kid playing video games. And it's like, no, it's not rotting our mind at all. You know, it's, it's, it's our version of what, your, of what your crossword puzzle was. That's just a game that's rotting your mind, said your grandfather. Why, when I was your age, we were out plowing the field, not doing crosswords, and on and on and on it goes. And you will do the same thing. All you 20-somethings out there, you will do the same thing when you're 60. You'll say, why in my day? We sat and we typed everything into social media on a keyboard. Look at you kids. You don't know, you don't know what social media is. Why in my day? <laughs> you'll have something. Um... Yeah, you have to make the decision uh, as you get older to say, you know what? That's this is it's not my it's not my stage anymore. It's their stage. So either I'm just gonna step aside and say, okay, you have your stage. I'm still gonna have an opinion on your stage, but you go ahead and have your stage. Or you say, it's time for me to go. And for me, it was just time for me to go. Uh, your arguments make sense when you uh, remove emotional personal ties. You mentioned moving your accounts to a U.S. bank. Uh, will you still use IBKR as a trader or the U.S. bank trading platform? Well, I have externally managed money, and I have my own uh, smaller uh, amount out of that that I manage myself. I will have an, uh, a Costa Rican IB account because I just need to be connected to the U.S. market. So I, I do have to be connected to it somehow. I have to engage with it, with, with it to do what I do. I just have to. Uh, but the majority uh, of the uh, money will be managed externally. Uh, and uh, for what I did, the way I did it, you're going to need a certain amount of net worth. It's not for everybody. You are going to need a certain amount of, uh, of net worth to get it done. Uh, so if you've got a couple hundred thousand, it's just not going to happen for you. Uh, so you'll have to find some other way uh, to, manage, uh, to manage those funds, but you can do it. Uh, through interactive brokers. You're going to need an address, which means you're going to need to be in a particular country to get that done. You cannot, and I would encourage you strongly not to break the law by trying to maintain your Canadian interactive broker's account, not paying Canadian tax while you're a resident of another country. I would not do that if I were you. Can we get some information on how the transfer of assets takes place, the difference in trading or taxation? Well, again, it, it probably wouldn't, uh, wouldn't apply to you because you, you have to be a high net worth individual uh, and not just the, tax eight, the, the, the uh, Revenue Canada or IRS's definition of what a high net worth individual is, in, 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 which would qualify you to invest in alternative investments or hedge funds. Uh, but a significant high net worth individual uh, uh, to be able to get access to certain types of products. Uh, Nordic countries already already gave my uh, 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 small outlook on that uh, or an answer to that. Uh, I know you've explained parts of the portfolio transfer process. Can you still make a video on the whole process and tax implications? Uh, again, it it because it's it's for a particular type of net worth. It it uh, wouldn't really apply very much. Okay, uh, next one's a comment. Uh, let's see. Could you make a video about politics or its implications on investment decisions, or could you recommend books? Uh, well, w when it comes to politics and its uh, uh, effect on investment decisions, you're really looking at uh, their policy towards taxes and their policy towards regulation. Uh, sometimes they introduce spending bills and they're important to keep your eye on and of course the level of debt and de debt issuance those tend to be the big things in uh, more developed economies I don't know if there's a book per se dedicated to this but almost every finance textbook uh, will have some section on government 
uh, and the benefits and risks that it poses. Uh, what are your thoughts on universal basic income in a world where, for example, technological advancements continue to eliminate jobs? Well, um, technological advancements have been eliminating jobs for a long time, but also creating jobs in other parts of the economy. There are whole industries that exist today uh, that simply didn't exist 20 years ago. Uh, so, um, no, I, I don't think you need universal basic income. Uh, there will be uh, adaptations and there will be some who cannot adapt and there will be some that will be left behind, but I don't know that you need to implement a whole universal basic income just just for that in every uh, um, transitioning economy. I shouldn't say transitioning, but in every economy that experiences growth, in every business cycle, there are always jobs that are eliminated over time. Certain tasks uh, will be sent offshore, certain types of jobs will be eliminated, but uh, the economy does create more and more and more jobs over time. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, just jump to that. Do you think uh, it matters whether a UBI program is implemented by cash transfers? Or more like an insurance policy to be cashed out in the event of permanent job loss? Mm. It would be hard to describe what permanent job loss looks like. So if I know that I can get UBI if I have permanent job loss, I'm untrainable. I, I can't be trained. Oh, my back hurts. My arm hurts. Oh, no, I can't do this job anymore. Driving truck for 20 years, uh, I, I can't, you know, I can't sit in a chair. I can't do this. You know, it will be played. The It will be played. Now, there's some people that would probably uh, need it, but there are already programs in place for it. Uh, as soon as I know that there's a cash for life, uh, uh, policy. Uh, if I'm, uh, if I have a permanent job loss, I will have a permanent job loss. That will be gamed. It will be played. Uh, I completely understand your point. Still, there are other things in life other than money. Uh, yes, fairness is is one, right? I know it must be painful uh, to earn, let's say, four million, pay half it to the government, given your current age. Will it compensate leaving the human relationships behind? I don't have very many human relationships. And listen, um, the majority of my relationships are you guys. It is the CFA community. Uh, it, I, it is uh, the market outlooks. <clears throat> I talk to you guys every week. Uh, uh, this, this is what keeps me going. I do feel like I'm in a conversation with you. Even though it's not voice to voice, you leave your comments, I give answers, I think about it. Um, it does feel like I'm in a community. I do not feel lonely and I do not feel isolated. As long as I have an internet connection, um, I'm alive, man, and I'm doing fine. Uh, to quote a song from the 60s, um, given your current age competency, now, I am 30 years, but I believe that at a certain stage of my life, I will be fine paying high taxes. Eh, it's hard to predict what you're going to think and feel 30 years from now. It's very difficult. Um, do you not want to see the world? At some point, you're going to say, look, I want to see the world. And if I can see the world and get a whole bunch of other things accomplished at the same time. I've always had a problem with a 53% tax rate. I've described it as a 40% tax rate and a 13.5% confiscation rate. That's the problem. If my taxes were 40%, my marginal tax rate were 40, we wouldn't have, a, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be talking about this. I'd be looking at other things. I, I wouldn't consider it because I'd think, well, that's fair. But it's not fair. It's 13.5% confiscation rate on top of the 40% tax rate. And I don't mind paying a 13% sales tax. But if I buy something just because other people can't buy it, you hit me with another 20%, that's unfair. Get me on one side or get me on the other side. But don't get me on both sides. It's unfair. And it's, just a, it's, just a, it's more of a matter of fairness uh, than it is... Um, I don't want to pay taxes. I have no problem paying taxes, but fair taxes. I have uh, uh, no problem with it at all. Or, said another way, if, if, if you were charging me 
53.5%. But, but celebrating success of, of not demonizing success and calling us tax cheats and spitting on us and, and coming back to us all the time as the enemy and that we just need to pay our fair share. If you wouldn't spit all over us all the time and demonize us while you're, while you're confiscating the majority of what we have, anything over 50% is the majority, um, if you weren't doing that at least... If you weren't calling us names at least at the same time, I, I could at least say, well, you know, at least I'm in a country that likes what I'm doing, that, that tries to find ways to, to uh, incentivize me to do more of this kind of stuff. Sure, it hits me with a big tax rate, but look at all these incentives it puts in place for me. That if I invest in other businesses, if I invest in entrepreneurs, I can get this or that, this break or that break. But, you know hit me with this tax, then turn around and say, oh, you want to enjoy some of that? We're going to hit you with another tax. Oh, and we're going to threaten more taxes, and we're going to call you the problem. We're going to call you. That's when, okay, enough is enough. And, and I've had enough. I've had enough. Um, I'm just trying to get your view on an angle that most people think you know, before moving to another country, even to another city within the same country. Uh, if this is too personal, I apologize. It's not too personal. Uh, it, it, it is a uh, narrow uh, a window of people who uh, fit into this space where they say, hey, I can go to another country where either their family is on board or they have limited family, where their income is not tied to their geography, uh, and, and they do uh, uh, want to grow and, and experience the world. Then it's a perfect it's a perfect opportunity, right? It, it would have been much harder. Again, 40% tax rate, good incentives uh, for success, and a success is not vilified by your politicians. Yeah, I probably would have had a harder time saying, eh, uproot my whole life, go here. Why don't I just go on vacation for three months here, vacation for three months there, and still maintain my, Cana you know, my Canadian residency? Maybe I would have tried something like that. Let's go for a vacation for a month here. Let's travel travel the world, not move to another country. But when you're unwelcome in your own house, come on. Uh, have you ever, uh, have you never calculated the PV of the tax effort you've been paying in Canada so far? The assumptions about the company Canada in the future makes a lot of sense, but my further question then is, why did you expect so long to change asset location? Well, I used I had staff, right? <clears throat> so it's difficult to just uproot and leave, uh, and leave your staff there because I know me. Uh, it would have it would have just been a matter of time before I, wherever I moved to, I would begin to hire there and eliminate at the other end because I would have wanted uh, um, uh, to be co-located with the staff. So it would just been a matter of time. I had staff. But there was an exit plan in place, and, and you sort of had to wait for that. But, you know, I, I probably should have moved at least a year before I sold. Uh, that would have uh, been the really profitable thing to do. The really profitable thing to do. But, you know, I didn't think about it at the time. It was, you know, stay in Ontario or go to Alberta. You know, and that was, that was all I was thinking about. But even going to Alberta wouldn't have avoided the capital gains tax I had to pay on the sale of the business. It wouldn't have avoided that. So I, I, I wouldn't have benefited from that. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, <clears throat> when you talk about redistribution, what specifically do you have in mind? If you're talking about health care, my view is that in the U.S., 70% of bankruptcies are due to medical reasons. Um... The vast majority of Americans are covered. Um, like, I think it's it's a, it's you know it's a significant number, but it's it's a small percentage that are not covered due to medical reasons. So, if you have a universal medical program, it attracts lots of lots of risk capital because of not well, no, can't it's not that's not happening in Canada. It's not attracting a lot of risk capital in Canada. That's not happening. If you have a really great idea in Canada, there's limited venture capital, limited angel investing. Uh, you're more likely to move to Boston, Colorado, Austin, or Silicon Valley uh, because that's where the money is. 
Uh, an entrepreneur can safely start a business and not have to worry about insurance expense in the family budget, approximately a thousand a month to support a family of three. Um, well, that's just not the case in Canada. Yeah, we have free health care, but it's not attracting anyone. Uh, and it's a matter of access to health care. Sure, it's free if you can get it. That's the problem. If, if you can get it, and I've, you know, uh, talked about health care lots of times in the past, I, I can't get a doctor. Uh, no doctors taking patients. So, I, I mean, if you can get it, it's, it's, once you get it, it's, it's on par with medical care you'll get anywhere else. But it's getting it. So the idea that it attracts business because there's free health care, not really. Uh, no, not really. It, 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 that doesn't show up in the numbers. Empirically, there's no evidence to support that, is what I can say. Uh, I don't know if it's just universal health care is the biggest component of government expense to justify high taxes. If it is, yes, something needs to be done to reduce the cost and therefore taxes. There's my squeaky chair again. If it is uh, not, then yes, other components of government expense should be addressed to reduce taxes. Well, I can think of, of a couple of things. Um, you know, and I said it in the previous video, we, uh, we provide taxpayer-subsidized crack pipes to crack addicts. You think I'm making that, and I know some of you think I'm making that up. I know some of you think I am, and I'm not. We provide taxpayer-funded needles, taxpayer-funded injection sites, uh, taxpayer staff on hand to make sure that when you inject yourself with your illegal heroin, you don't die. We don't arrest you for your illegal heroin. We want you to come back tomorrow to inject yourself again. There was a story uh, out of Vancouver of this woman uh, who uh, is a dangerous offender, and she's moving into a community. So they uh, set up flyers in this community. Let the community know that this woman is moving to this community. She cannot be on a certain street and a list of things she cannot do. And she can only inject heroin in a safe injection site. Yeah. They limit, oh, we're going to let everybody know. Here's a dangerous person. She can't be on this street. But God forbid we stigmatize drug use. Let's tell everyone she's a dangerous offender. But God forbid we stigmatize drug use. She's still allowed having, um, you know, a court case in front of her and being out on the street waiting for this to happen. She's still allowed to do heroin with a carve out an exemption for that. No contact with these people. Don't do this. Don't do that. Wear this ankle. But if you want to do heroin, if you want to do heroin, uh, here's the nearest taxpayer uh, funded injection site. It's okay. We don't want to stigmatize drug use. You criminal you. Like, I mean, like, come on. Like, it's gone too far. And yes, I am serious. We have taxpayer-funded crack pipes for crack addicts because they can't afford their own. We don't want to stigmatize that now, do we? And there was a big story a while back in, I think, it, uh, I forget what Toronto paper it was, but Toronto was paying something like $30,000 a year to brand them. So you had this little bag with your little crack pipe in there, and there was a little sticker on the bottom, uh, you know, City of Toronto, blah. They were paying money, taxpayer money, to put their branding on the free crack pipe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When, when you go too far one way, you get to a place where you look around, hopefully you wake up and you look around and say, how the hell did we get here? Who thought this was anything near a good idea, right? Uh, let's see. You mentioned uh, implementing social programs, decreases GDP per capita. Why is this the case? So when I did that, I said, uh, you have to make the behavioral argument. It changes behavior. So the more and more social programs that you implement, uh, you change the behavior of the system because you change the nature of the incentives and the disincentives. So when you do that, you disincentivize people like me, you disincentivize capital uh, to stick around and be taxed for it, uh, uh, which then just lowers investment because without savings, there is no investment. That is an identity. All savings equals investment. All savings equal investment. No savings, no investment. And redistribution is one of the uh, least effective methods 
of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, encouraging GDP. The multiplier on government spending is extremely low. So it's, it, it just fails on, on almost every count I can think. Uh, why is the, the option example is clear to see that the option has a cost and will not improve the index returns where some people argue that implementing social programs actually increase GDP per capita. <clears throat> education improves. I'm not against education. Uh, uh, education is something I'm not against. You want free education up to grade 12, that's fine. After that, it's on you. After that, I think it's on you because not everybody goes off to school. And if you're getting the taxpayer to pay it, what you're doing is you're privatizing the gains and socializing the costs. You pay for my education, and the value of my education will accrue to me. Me. But you pay for it, please, and it'll accrue to me. So uh, I, don't, I don't agree with that. Education is an asset. Uh, a house is an asset. And education is an appreciating asset, so is a house. If we're going to give away free education, you've got to give away free houses. Because it is the same thing. It's, it's, it's the purchase of an appreciating asset. It's not an expense. Tuition is not an expense. It's the purchase of an asset, right? So if we're going to talk about giving away free education, I want a free house. You, you, let's give people free houses. It's the same. If you're going to forgive $60,000 in tuition, you got to give six, you got to forgive $60,000 in mortgage expense to everybody else who didn't go to college. Because why would you buy an asset for a small group of people for 30% of the population? Why would you buy an asset for them? Why would you have the taxpayer buy them an asset and not buy an asset for the other 70%? <clears throat> That's an unfair, uh, uh, an unfair system. So no, I would be against anything above grade 12. <clears throat> but if we're going to mandate that somebody stays in school until they're the age of consent... Uh, then, then at that point, if the government's going to mandate you do it, then I, I see no problem with investing in the education system. I got no problem with that. But with the education system, you also have a private option. I can choose to send my kids to private school if I had kids. Um, but with health care, which is far more important, your body is far more important than your education, far more important... The government doesn't give you a choice of a private system. <clears throat> That's a big deal. Um, in fact, Nordic countries, we've already talked about uh, Nordic countries. It comes in the change of the behavior. If you, if you change the behavior of the system, and this is pretty much what you have to do, you change the behavior of the system. The biggest components of GDP is C plus I. Those are the two biggest components. G you don't want G to be a big component because of G, the bigger G gets, it crowds out everything else and G is inefficient. Uh, G disincentivizes investment. It disincentivizes progress because uh, capital will just go somewhere else. An economy that is all G is either communist or socialist. So you don't want it to be all G. You want it to be C and I. C, the consumer. Uh, I is investment. Well, the consumer um, doesn't spend income. They spend disposable income, which is uh, how much money they have left over after tax. So the more tax there is, uh, the less uh, is available for C. Uh, and uh, if you keep raising taxes and there's lower and lower C, you'll also get lower and lower S, which means you'll get lower and lower I. Uh, and those are the two, the two drivers of, of growth in any economy. Uh, when those start uh, fading away and G starts rising and rising, it's, it's, it's only a matter of time uh, before a system like that caves in on itself because it's unsustainable. Uh, if you have less and less C and less and less I, then you need more and more government intervention to prop up the economy, which means you need higher taxes, which means you get lower disposable income, so you get lower C and lower I, which means you need more government spending to support everybody else, which means you need more taxes, and it's a vicious circle. So you don't want to even get involved in, in, in that sort of thing. You want to have a, a healthy C and a very healthy I. The lower... The higher the taxes, the lower the disposable income, the less healthy your eye will be. So there is a balance, 
and it is it, it's there's a name for it called the laugher curve uh, and it's not laughter as in laughter as in <laughs> you got to be kidding me that's a curve laugher laugher and it's very simple it looks like this it's very very simple uh, but probably as close to an economic fact as you can get it's still a theory but it fits the data quite well um, <clears throat> so this is a tax rate this is revenue zero taxes as you start raising taxes governments start raising revenue up to a point once you go past that capital leaves and uh, you actually have lower and lower government revenues um, the economy starts moving underground people start doing uh, things to avoid paying taxes uh, capital leaves money leaves uh, uh, successful people leave potential leaves and eventually you have to keep raising taxes because money is leaving so whatever's left over has to be taxed more and that forces more money underground more money out of the country so you got to keep raising tax you you cross a tipping point uh, in the amount of revenues that you raise the state of california is already past that tipping point the state of new york is dangerously close to that tipping point uh, i think that uh, the province of ontario is probably at that tipping point now when I say they're at that tipping point you have to be in that marginal tax rate if you're making 60,000 a year and you live in Ontario you probably say it doesn't affect me not yet not yet because you're not in that marginal tax rate again think of that Pareto distribution it's those at the very top that you precisely do not want leaving you want to incentivize them to stay somehow calling them tax cheats saying they don't pay, pay their fair share threatening to raise taxes 20 different ways on them is not incentivizing them to leave it's disincent sorry it's not incentivizing them to stay it's disincentivizing them to stay but you need experienced people to understand that and we don't elect experienced people anymore so they don't understand that so i think you know uh, the problem with north american both in the u.s and Canada is is where politics is these days and it takes a lot of courage uh, to cut spending it takes a lot of courage to balance a budget and since each party is self-interested both can on the conservative side and on the liberal side they're all self-interested they're all self-interested I'm not just signaling out liberals here even if the conservatives win the next election there'll be deficits and there'll be increased debt at some point, there's got to be a reckoning, but, uh, you know, um, this is the direction, the very real direction uh, uh, that is at risk unless, unless our politicians start to recognize that we do have a problem. If they don't recognize we have a problem, that in itself is the problem. Okay. Apart from purely financial views, some other human factors might influence the decision. Climate, I got beautiful climate. Access to health care, I got great access to health care. <clears throat> uh, safety, I'm very safe. I'm behind two gates. Uh, you got to get through a gate to get into, into just the area where I live. You got to get past a gate with a guard with a gun. Uh, and then as you drive into the community, you got to get past my gate to get onto my property. So, uh, and you got to get past the 42 cameras that are all around the property you're not getting in here without being on 12 cameras minimum before you even get to the front door minimum before you even get to the front door so i'm very safe uh relationships you guys are my relationships i still have you i still have you guys don't leave me interestingly finland provides high quality of life it seems uh, to have high tax rates in canada has low uh, migration rate and it's not uh, free traded to get free traded to get shares I don't know what that means free traded to get shares um, there well, I forget what uh, what channel did a documentary on this uh, looking at the uh, at the Nordic countries in terms of how well their social systems are working uh, all of the social policies they implemented and it did not it did not come out well uh, the there the I wish I could remember I think it was uh, it wasn't it wasn't uh, one of these uh, you know like Fox News or it wasn't something like that that did it it was really down the down the middle uh, uh, channel that did it I can't remember if it was Frontline or 
if it was like a PBS thing or it was something, it was something that had some, some value to it. Think, you know, when you look at the name, you say, okay, well, I can expect, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it to be nonpartisan here. So I'd, I'd sort of look for something like that on YouTube. I remember seeing it on YouTube. <clears throat> uh, let's see. Great use of the university class to demonstrate the free pass ideology, fully socialist approach, takes incentives away from the top and bottom to work hard. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, do you feel in Costa Rica there's a much uh, a wider range of the quality of living due to their tax-friendly policies? Poor people are very poor. This is true. This is true. High crime rates. Not really. If you remove the drug trade, <clears throat> and it's the same in the U.S. If you remove the gang violence, like gang on gang violence, if you remove that, uh, violent crime in the U.S. does drop a lot. If you if you take that out, um, most of these most of these criminal gangs are not interested in you. They're interested in getting rid of the other criminal gangs, and that's usually where a lot of the violence happens, and it ends up skewing the numbers. <clears throat> same thing down here. If you remove all the drug-related stuff between the uh, the rival gangs and the rival drug uh, drug groups. Uh, if you remove that, it's the, the violent crime numbers drop considerably. And as I've said before, they're not interested. <clears throat> they're not interested in you. Just stay out of their way. They're not going to bother you. They don't. They don't want to draw attention to themselves. They really don't want anything to do with you uh, uh, at all. Unless you unless you get in their business, right? And then and then well now you got a problem. Um, not overly familiar with Costa Rica and the population. Uh, if this is correct and the gap is wide, it is wide. This is contrasting against your view on what Canada is. <clears throat> no, 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 it's uh, it's not. Uh, what is elevating? Uh, the local population. Keep in mind, in Costa Rica, if you take away the expats, you probably have a population of around three and a half, four million. Expats meaning people who've come to the country because of whatever reason, you know, that's why they're here. You'd have three and a half, four million. Uh, not enough to encourage any local production of anything. Uh, so you would have gen a generally agrarian population uh, and a generally poor population, very poor. Uh, by having a territorial tax system, it invites people like me down that says, you got a lot of money, come on down, because we know when you're here, you're going to want to buy furniture, you're going to want to buy clothes, you're going to want your lawn maintained, you're going to want your pool taken care of, you got a big enough property, you're going to have you're going to have house cleaners and maids, you're going to use services. If we are not a big enough population to have any kind of domestic production facility like an automotive plant set up and give everybody jobs, we need to do something else. So it, it, it is a for a country uh, that had to think about, well, what do we do? We're just not big enough to attract investment. What do we do? Oh, I know. What's the big incentive here? Well, the tax rate. Let's work with that. More territorial tax, and there we go. So when I come here, well, I pay a certain type of tax. Uh, you pay an import tax on everything that you buy, and people like us are not going to buy you know, the $20,000 car, we're going to buy the $150,000 car that has $70,000 of tax in there because everything has an import tax. Uh, so it is actually, when you have a small population for a country, what else can you do, right? Uh, now, if the country had 100 million people, it would be attracting a lot of foreign investment because you have a source of cheap labor. But the, the, the labor pool isn't big enough in that sense uh, to justify a plant to build something only to have to ship it somewhere else. It's just not, the, the labor, the size of the labor force is not big enough. So you have to do something else. Um, so that there is this disparity is the start of creating a middle class. You must have that. If you have a whole bunch of poor people and no prospects for that country, you have to find a way to get capital. And if you can't get capital through direct foreign investment in the economy, you're going to have to create another class and maybe import that class of people that has a lot of money. So you're going to have this wide wealth gap, but that will start drawing some of these people up because that money's got to be spent somewhere, that money. And the hope is that while you're here, you may see something and go, hey, there's an opportunity to invest in something. Here's an opportunity to invest in something. That's how you then start to create that middle class without 
this there is nothing there is nothing uh, to pull the bottom up there's nothing so you may as well you may as well get something in here uh, so even though this is this is the distribution now it is a wise distribution considering where you have to go and and you cannot do a bottom-up growth on this one because you need investment what can you do with such a small population right all right uh, let's see I understand your move. My mother is Costa Rican. It's a beautiful country. I spent a lot of time there. My question is what about high crime rate? Already, uh, already talked about that. Um, uh, I've been mugged there before. Well, it depends on where you are. I'd have to know more about where you are and what you were doing and what you were wearing and you know what time of night it was and where you were walking. Like any, like any country, you gotta listen. There are some neighborhoods in America. I would not advise you to walk through at night. <laughs> I would not advise you to walk through it at night. Detroit, drop you off at Seven Mile in Greenfield and leave you there. For anyone in Detroit, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You may not make it out. You may not make it out. So, yeah, every country has certain neighborhoods where you just don't go, uh, period, right? I don't know if Canada has those neighborhoods. I think Toronto has, has one of those neighborhoods where you just don't show up I think it was with Jane and Dundas am I get do I do I have that right I'm not really sure but somebody tell me uh, assuming that I agree with your arguments uh, what is your advice for those of us who have not reached a wealth threshold for this dynamic to impact us negatively uh, directly well then then you're not in my position uh, if it's not impacting you you're not in my position and if you're comfortable uh, with the direction, uh, uh, the social direction of our government. If you're comfortable with everything, then just stay put. Uh, if you're not, well, you have your vote. And at some point, uh, as you uh, uh, progress through life, if your vote doesn't work and you simply can't uh, 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 live with the government that you have, you, you, you shake your head every day thinking, I, can't, I, can't, I just can't keep going here, then, then yeah. Uh, you'll come to the decision. You'll come to that decision on your own. If you're in my shoes, would you follow the same path of accumulating wealth as much as I can in Canada, and then leave when the opportunity cost becomes too great? Pretty much. Uh, well, you have a low tax rate right now, so you're probably on this part of the Laffer curve. At some point, you will, uh, you know, if tax rates stay high, you'll cross the hump and you'll say, "What am I paying for?" What am I paying for? Listen, I, I love Bill Maher. I, I like watching his show because I find that one thing I like about that guy when he interviews people, he has no fear. Uh, he will say what he, he'll ask the tough questions. He doesn't, he doesn't lowball anyone. He'll ask the tough questions straight out. I like that guy. And he said this before, I haven't changed. The Democrats have. I, I'm, I'm still a liberal. It's just the Democrats have changed. I haven't changed. And he even complains about California. You know, he, he says, look, it took me this long just to get solar. It took me almost two years just to get all the permits to get solar. You know, and, and the roads are packed and, and, and you know, the highways you can't drive on. He has a litany of problems. He says, what am I paying these high taxes for? And so many people have already left California because of that, right? And, and not only that, just this idea that you can... You can legitimize crime if it's done by a disaffected person. Oh, let it go. Just let it go. Um, so, uh, uh, um, yeah, it, you'll get to a point, you know, unless the tax rates change, you'll get to a point where you, where you will ask yourself, what am, I, what am I paying these taxes for? For, for these silly, stupid programs. If this is how you're going to spend it, I, I got a problem. Now, you can't opt out of certain programs. You can't say, look, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I opt out of your free crack pipe program. No way. No way. I, I, I'm not giving you tax dollars to supply crack pipes. I, I'm out. I'm out. I can't opt out. Uh, you know, so. Uh, if it's strictly an economic decision and the friction of uprooting is small, going to a better tax country is rational given you can maintain a comfortable living standard. <clears throat> yeah, I do. Other than this squeaky chair, hear it? Like, it's a new chair, and it's already squeaking. So I don't have the, the comfortable lifestyle I had back in Canada. My chair didn't squeak. Here it squeaks, but I did. Uh, I have some WD-40 downstairs. I just haven't done the, the task yet. 
Most people have families and communities that make this uh, a non-optimizing, non-economic decision. That is true. I'm American and I've lived abroad in Asia for over a decade before moving back to the U.S. a few years back. <clears throat> I lived in a wealthy area of China and often felt it was better to be poor in America than rich in China because with all the problems of home, at least I could always count on getting proper medical care or healthy food. Now that I have kids, there's a small chance there's a small chance I would live outside the U.S. I'm not sure how Canada works, but in the U.S. we can always move to a different state if we're trying to optimize taxes. Yeah, Canada has Alberta. <clears throat> Surprisingly, finance knowledge isn't that helpful in this decision-making beyond hypothetical examples. The U.S. is absolutely the U.S. is absolutely a tax haven if you know a state and trust. Well, okay, sure which I don't, but I am aware assets would be much safer in a South Dakota trust or a Delaware LLC, for example, than in Central American country. They can turn on a dime in terms of tax policy on gringos. <laughs> yeah. Um, I didn't bring my uh, capital into the country. I did not do that. I brought me into the country. I bought a house in the country, a significant one, <clears throat> which, which does have an investment opportunity associated with it. In fact, tomorrow there's a wedding going on here, uh, which is a significant, uh, a significant uh, price for one day, 4500 for one day, because I do have a significant property uh, which can host uh, weddings. And, and when you have what they call here iconic properties uh, you can do well by saying okay well you use my place for a day and <clears throat> uh, so it, it does have an investment an investment side to it uh, but if if the tax rates did change on people like me <clears throat> then then um, it would be difficult to tax me without income right so you'd have to at least figure out well you know, where's your income? And if, if there was some growing tax, if it turned into a residential tax system, well, there still are other territorial tax systems in the world. <clears throat> so I don't think that that would go away. I have some family in Ontario, California, and they're not happy about the current state there as well. I wish you uh, all the best in CR, brother. Under the right circumstances, I think you have no reason to second-guess your decision. Greetings from Cali. Uh, definitely agree. See that what I did there? Cali. Like I'm like I'm in there, man. Cali. Greetings from Cali, man. Uh, definitely agree with your reasoning and examples. I do see some shifts from uh, the very left-leaning liberal views here uh, to more we can't legalize crime and don't teach math at schools so nobody feels excluded views the last 12 months. <clears throat> yeah, I think, uh, I think you can experiment uh, with these really extreme liberal views and i don't even think they're liberal anymore i think they they cross from liberal to being illiberal um and you're not doing anybody any favors by doing this stuff uh we can't legalize crime yeah i think people are getting sick and tired of that and the idea of not teaching math because it excludes certain people how insulting can you be to the people you think you're helping, oh, those people don't can't do math. Let's just not teach. What the hell? Do you even hear yourself when you speak? Right? You want to pull them aside and say, you, do you do you even hear yourself? Though they can't do math. What, what are you talking about? You know, it's this low expectations they have. I think it was was it Bush that said, you know, it's the soft bigotry of low expectations. That's why I say. You know, it's it's more illiberal than liberal, and, and I think yeah, I think more and more people, you know, at first you just sort of rolled your eyes and said, oh, geez, and then you started shaking your head, and then you started, you know, publicly so people can hear you, and to the point now where some people are, you know, have no fear of, of the mob, the left mob now are just saying, okay, this is this is this has gone too far now, this is just ridiculous. Uh, so there is. Uh, 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 a book called San Francisco um, that that's rather interesting and I think if you google San Francisco I think you can uh, watch the the documentary based on the book on, on YouTube <clears throat> that looks at, at what happened to San Francisco and how it resulted from what were otherwise well-meaning policies uh, where the individuals did not think of the unintended consequences. They just didn't think it through. They, it was more about virtue signaling and here are some great policies without thinking through what the end game would be. Uh, love your grade redistribution model, but you have not accounted for grade inflation. 
and we talk about that in the next video the bottom 20 percent are now grades greater than 60 and no one fails unless they have not shown up in 90 percent of the lectures while the top are still at 90 yeah <clears throat> yeah i know there is uh grade inflation uh it used to be the case uh where in a class uh, you would you know like 50 years ago you'd say there are two a's uh, eight B's and 12 C's. That's the grade distribution. It's up to you to get the A. And it was a competition. Now it's almost everybody gets an A. It's it's hard. It's actually hard to fail someone. Uh, I taught in the U.S. where tuition is much, much higher. And one person clearly failed. I mean, they clearly failed. Uh, I had to pass them anyways because I failed and they complain I paid three thousand dollars for this course you know and and that was that was it they paid three thousand dollars for the course you can't fail them uh, well, you know we're not gonna refund their money you can't feel like that was just it you can't fail them um, yeah it's getting to the point where you you simply can't fail a student anymore they will just take it upstairs and and you know they're not a student they're a customer when you start thinking of them as customers well then you know you've sort of lost all integrity to the point where i have a degree well yes yeah, so does everyone else you know welcome to starbucks here's your apron um yeah the, i think great inflation is a is a big problem but but it is it is something that we have very, as professors, you have very little control over uh, unless you, you have tenure and you're absolutely safe. It is difficult uh, to, fa to uh, fail someone. What about friends and family in Canada? Uh, no friends, uh, sorry, no family, minimal friends, really. Have you considered becoming active in politics? No, no. Politics will never, ever, ever be for me. It's an ugly game played by ugly people. And I would not lower myself to those levels. I would not degrade myself uh, by being in the same room as those people. I just wouldn't do it. Curious uh, to hear why you chose Costa Rica. Okay, so I already did a video on that, which was the second one. Uh, this one, the first one was why I left Canada. The second is why I chose Costa Rica. And I got one more video coming on that. Uh, I agree with so many points. I own a real estate whole coat, significant number of tenants. Good old, old government takes 50% of my company's earnings because it's considered passive income. Yeah, that is a problem in Canada. Is the passive income law that the Liberals passed, of course, without any kind of uh, 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 you know experience about what this means. They wouldn't have had to pay out so much in business support during COVID if they understood that a company that has retained earnings that wants to leave it in the business will earn passive income. But they said anything over 50,000, we're going to hit you with an extremely punishing tax rate. You must take it out of the business. You can't, you can't invest your retained earnings. Now, if you're a large company, you go right ahead. You go right ahead and do whatever the hell you want. But if you're a small business, no, no. You'd almost think that large companies wrote the wrote this wrote this law, so that when small business hit a a, a, a uh, rough patch in the economy, they had no retained earnings to get them through and would fail. You'd almost think that big business wrote it because it is it is almost designed to eliminate small businesses. So if I have retained earnings in my company. Uh, I don't have to take it out. I can say, look, we're going to leave it here because we're going to invest more at some point in time or we're going to keep it around for a rainy day. Well, you don't leave money just sitting there. You, you put it somewhere, probably in marketable securities, T-bills, bankers, acceptance, money market, securities, things like that. <clears throat> well, if you started earning too much money, the government wanted to punish you. No, no, you can't keep it there. You got to take it out. Well... COVID comes around, how many businesses don't, don't have enough retained earnings in their business? <clears throat> they had to take the money out, and when they took the money out, they got a big tax hit. So they had a smaller little bit of money. So if you had to put that in the business, suddenly you have less to put back in the business than you took out because when you take it out as dividends, the government wants its share. So it was forcing you to take it out or it was going to tax you on it anyways, which means businesses had a hard time building up retained earnings and a cash uh, a safety cash pile well there's COVID the government the government is responsible 
for a lot of the expense during COVID. They can't, they can't blame successful people for that. That was a stupid, stupid policy introduced by the Liberals, introduced by the Liberals as a, as a feel-good thing. Look how wonderful we are. Look how we're taking care of things. We're going after these greedy business owners. Come on, man. Father lived there a couple months when I was a child. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Looking forward to the Raven video if it's still coming. I'm going to pass on the Raven for now because it's just not the time for the Raven. I will do the Raven. Uh, but I'm going to do on New Year's Day, New Year's Day, you're going to get a video, a poetry video uh, with three poems. Uh, Stopping by Woods uh, on a Snowy Evening. Um, you're going to get one... <clears throat> Not really a poem, but it's uh, from uh, Anais Nin, or Anais Nin, depending on uh, how you pronounce her names, and one by Wordsworth. Uh, three in a row, because there's a theme, there's a message across those three, so you'll get that New Year's Day. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I do see an issue with vault distribution and free choices. You explain without a doubt, I would do the same as you in your situation. Being reluctant to join simplified narrative that hardworking people uh, became successful and lazy people became poor. Reality is that luck is definitely an important part. Well, now let's let's first of all define what luck is. I will tell you this: uh, the economy is full of opportunity. Opportunity is everywhere. It's everywhere. Uh, but if you don't know where to look, you're not going to find it. If you don't know anything about engineering, you're not going to find any opportunity that requires some engineering solution. If you know nothing about the human body uh, or, or uh, uh, biochemistry, you're not going to find opportunities there. Opportunity is everywhere. Uh, so if opportunity is everywhere, but you're unprepared, you'll never find it. But if you're prepared, over time, you're bound to bump into some opportunity somewhere. Now, that is the definition of luck. Was that luck? Preparation, opportunity. Luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Being that opportunity is everywhere <clears throat> and that uh, outcomes are probabilistic, uh, the more uh, you uh, invest in yourself, the more you are prepared, the more you learn about a whole bunch of different things and you continually learn, the higher the probability that you're going to bump into one of those opportunities. Now, was that luck? Luck is winning the lottery. That is luck. That is nothing but luck. But if I prepare myself uh, and I try something and it fails, and I try something and it fails, and I try something and it hits, was I lucky or was I persistent in an uh, environment full of opportunity? It's like fishing. Uh, uh, are you getting lucky or are you playing probabilities? You look at the, the uh, water, you look at the depth of the water, you see a rocky bottom, you know what kind of fish are there, you think these kind of fish go after this kind of lure, you bait your lure with that, you put it in the water. Would you say that catching a fish is just all about luck? Or would you say, hey, you've prepared, you've prepared to catch a fish. Now it's just a matter of probability. Because there are fish there and you are prepared. Right? So the idea that, oh, you got lucky. No, no, I was persistent. I was prepared. There was opportunity and I was bound to hit something at some point. So I don't know that I would call it luck. If you want to say winning the lottery is luck, that is the purest definition of luck. So I don't know that I would, that I would call it luck. Uh, ideally, we have a system where every child have roughly the same education. Uh, every child has access to the to, uh, the public education system for free, uh, all the way up to grade 12 for free. Uh, health care, it's free health care. Nutrition opportunity, well, they have opportunity, but that comes down to parental choice. If the parents aren't buying nutritious food, that kid won't get nutritious food. The kid can't make that choice on their own. The kid, the kid has to rely on the parents. Um, then as an adult, you keep what you make. Then aggressive inheritance tax once you do. Why aggressive inheritance tax? I don't understand that. I've already paid tax on this. 
I've already paid tax on this. Why have an aggressive inheritance tax? Why? You've already had your opportunity to tax this money. To have an aggressive inheritance tax is to tax it all over again. It's already after tax dollars. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. Uh, to fund aforementioned system, provide equal opportunity for every child. Why is it the government's responsibility to provide equal opportunity for every child? There, 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 there are parents involved here. What happened to parents' responsibility? Why is it the government's opportunity to provide opportunity for every child? Parents have a job to do too. It's a choice you made. You decided to have children. It's your responsibility. Now, there are some things a government can do when you have a child. Here's some free education. Uh, here's some free health care. Uh, must we move into their house and, and buy them food and make sure they're eating the right thing and, and make sure that nobody has an opportunity, that nobody... Why is it the government's responsibility, right? Whatever happened to personal responsibility? You know, it's your own responsibility to provide a better life for your kids than you had. That's on you. I don't know why, why it's the government's responsibility to step in and, and, and ensure proper parenting, ensure all of these things. If there are social impediments, get rid of them. But I don't know that we have the kind of social impediments here. I don't even know if we have real social impediments here. Certainly not the kind you would find in some countries where is, if, if you're of a certain background or if you're of a certain... Uh, uh, from a certain family or a certain, we'll call it tribe, let's say, because in some countries that that's the language they use, that, that opportunities are simply just closed to you. That is structural. That's something you want to tear down. We don't have that. We don't have a sign that says if you're of this background, you can't, you can't apply to this job. Well, we do now. Actually, we do now. If you're a white male, no, you know, you don't have no need to apply. It's amazing how far the left goes. You go so far left, you come out on the right, and you're just as racist as the KKK, except except you just you just disagree on which skin pigmentation to be racist about. But I don't I don't agree with that. That that <clears throat> that that the system is to provide equal opportunity uh, for every child. Um, that's up to the parent uh, uh, to do. I mean, there has to be some modicum of personal responsibility for the choices you make. With that being said, I don't think this will become a real policy ever since human nature is such that parents want better opportunity for their children than other children. This is true. <clears throat> well, I don't, I, you know, I would say parents want a better life for their child than they had. That is, that is the hope of every parent is that their child will have a better life than they have. I don't know if they want to say, I want to provide my child a better life than every other child, just better than the one I had. <clears throat> so, okay, but anyways, aside from that, do you see any logical issue with the system I proposed? Well, I've already critiqued it, so we're good there. Let's move on. Two points. Um, point one, 99% sure conservatives are going to win on the next election. The polls agree with me right now, sure. Polls normally underestimate conservative votes. I'm confident that there will be a conservative wipeout not seen in decades. State newcomers are likely to vote liberal, and currently we're importing millions of them. Perhaps they will vote liberal, I'm not sure. However, it will take at least five, six years before those newly arrived can vote, so they will not be a factor in the next election. <clears throat> hmm. I believe that there will be mean reversion within the liberal party. Hmm. Trudeau represents a significant deviation from the norm within the Liberal Party of past decades. Yes, he does. As you pointed out, he is woke, incompetent, and self-obsessed. It appears that the voices within his party are growing louder for him to step down. Yeah, he's already he was already aware of that. The, the, there was <clears throat> more than just a few. The, the majority would have liked him to step aside. And he said, I'm not going anywhere. Sound familiar? The leader of a party saying, I'm not going anywhere anywhere sound familiar all right uh and he's already said he's not going anywhere he's and, and he's not he's not going anywhere unless they kick him out he's not going to like his father take a walk in the snow come back and say it's time for me to step aside he will not do that you have to kick this guy out right 
After the Liberals' humiliating defeat in 2025, there'll likely be a more sensible Liberal leader to revert the party to the center. Hopefully, right? <clears throat> Out of curiosity, what kind of changes do you need to see in Canada for you to come back? Uh, you know, I don't know if I want to come back. Um, you know, I, uh, I grew up in a small northern community, and it was always nice to visit, but it's certainly not a place I ever wanted to move back to. Um, now, I grew up in Canada, and I've lived in the U.S., and I was more than happy when I was doing my Ph.D. in the U.S. to just stay in the U.S. I, I, I wasn't at any time longing to return back to my people. <laughs> my people. I had no longing to return back uh, at all. Uh, it was just a matter of there was uh, somebody who knew me and said, you know, there's a job opening here and I needed a place to go and write my dissertation for a while. And I thought, well, why not? Why not take a short term contract to finish writing the dissertation, which uh, turned into a, a, a longer stint? <clears throat> but the, uh, going back was just was just sort of the way the cookie crumbled at the time, but I never felt a need to go back or a drive or a pull. In fact, I was just thinking that I wasn't gonna, but I, here I am, I'm just gonna get a job at some university in the US and that's where I'm gonna stay. Uh, I'm here now and I, st I have no desire to go back. I mean, I, uh, I have no desire. So no, I don't, think, I don't think I would be going back and I, uh, I don't think the Conservatives winning a majority in 2025 is going to change uh, the direction of deficits, the direction of debt, uh, and the eventual increase of taxes somewhere, somewhere. Let's keep in mind it was the Conservatives who first introduced the, uh, the GST under Mulroney. It was the Conservatives who did that. There was no goods and services tax before that. That was a brutal uh, 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 slaughter for the Conservatives, they lost. I mean, they didn't even have official party status after that election was over. They got murdered. Um, the the uh, a Conservative win doesn't change the deficit, doesn't change the debt. Uh, it gives us better probability or a better chance that it won't get worse, but no guarantee. So I, I don't know so much that it's a Conservative solution as much as it is a, uh, 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 a party that would win and say, we have a debt problem. I need to hear those words. We have a debt problem. But if you say those words and you solve it with revenues, well, there goes taxes, right? And who are you going to tax? Uh, okay. Such a nostalgic voice. I learned CFA level one from you about five years ago. Just happy to hear your voice again. Living in Dubai. Look at the name. Living in Dubai, in a tax, uh, in a territorial tax uh, area as well. Sometimes it blows my mind. The U.S., a country that was founded primarily because of unfair taxation on the colonies, has no constraint about a maximum po possible aggregate tax rate in the Bill of Rights. I agree. I think it should be enshrined in law that there should be some maximum tax rate that governments cannot go across. Then, then they would lose the, the, the need to demonize successful people. They would lose that, right? When your government shits all over you for doing nothing more than doing the right thing, investing in the country, paying your taxes, and they shit all over you every day. You know, enough is enough. But yeah, I agree. Let's put a, a maximum tax, but... You know, what, what would happen now if they put a maximum tax in? It's like your hotel, you know, when you're reading that little note behind the door, the maximum room rate is $873 a night, but you're only paying $169. It's so that they can do surge pricing or, uh, 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 you know, high season pricing. They can go up to that much if they want. So they just said, they say, okay, let's make sure we never have a tax rate greater than 84%. You know, it would be some number that's still way above where we were. Um, have you considered moving around different countries uh, within a year or several years? Mm, I think that's too much. I think uh, I, to to uh, for me, I think every couple of years, maybe maybe in about five years, right? I think I still have a good forty years of life left. My family was all very long lived, uh, uh, at least on, you know for my grandmother's side. They all 
smoked and drank like you wouldn't believe as a kid. I mean, uh, they just have a case of beer sitting by their feet in the kitchen floor, and one cigarette would light the next cigarette, <laughs> and they would smoke and drink beer, and it was Labatt's 50. The most disgusting beer you could find, Labatt's 50, any, any Northern Canadian, and little stubby bottles too, and they just sit and smoke and sit and drink and smoke and drink and smoke. Uh, anyways, they all lived into their late 80s, early 90s. So I don't do any of that stuff, so I think I'm good. Uh, and if you think 40 more years and you divide it by uh, five, that gives me eight countries in the world that I can still live in uh, for five years at a time. That's a well-lived life, I think. Uh, what is the minimum level of wealth you, uh, would you say, can enable a comfortable, non-extravagant life at Costa Rica for a foreigner? If your net worth was 10% of what it is now, would your quality of life be really any different? Well, I certainly wouldn't have bought this place. I, I would have been more than comfortable in a 5,000 square foot house uh, in, uh, uh, a, um, in, in a community. Uh, that would have been about $500,000. Uh, and as long as I had an income, I mean, if you don't have any income, uh, then you're not paying any taxes, then you're not really saving anything by being here. So it would have to be some income. But the quality of life is what you make it, right? If you're looking for the environment to give you a quality of life, you're missing the point. The, the life, the quality of the life that you live is what you make of it. Uh, I'm always learning and I get to learn a new language now and uh, to me learning I'm alive my brain is most alive when I'm learning I got a great quality of life uh, uh, where I am right now I'm not cold I'm not hungry I'm not uh, out in the streets I'm not uh, you know looking for my next meal I'm not uh, sick I well, I ran into a couple of snakes and a couple of spiders, including a wandering spider, which is a really bad spider to, to, to run into. It was an epic battle, but I won. I won. I'm bigger. Not deadlier, <laughs> but bigger. I won. Uh, that's one dead wandering spider now. Um, but, but my quality of life is good. Uh, you, you are the architect, really, of a lot of your quality of life by the decisions that you make, you know, by the food you put in your body, by the exercise that you do, by the stuff you put in your mind, you are the architect of your own quality of life for the most part. Not 100%, but for the most part, you are the architect of that. Uh, I think we're going to have to stop soon because there's so many of these. Uh, wouldn't you say it is a bit of counterintuitive that you hold stakes in American companies? No. Why would that be counterintuitive? Uh, when they aren't like heavily exposed to a regime that may increase their taxes? Oh, no. Um, not really, no. Uh, the the uh, most of these companies, um, I wouldn't say most, the, the, um, the tax rate, the corporate tax rate, uh, in the U.S. is not very high. Some individual tax rates in some states go into the 50% range, but not for corporations. Uh, it, is, it is quite low, and corporations do a lot in terms of, off, uh, of subsidiaries uh, in other countries of where they can concentrate certain types of activity. Uh, so, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not too concerned. I'm not concerned with that at all. Uh, now, if there was a move to raise the corporate tax rate to 45%, yeah, then at that, at that point, you got to start thinking about, uh, uh, you know, wh what you're going to do. But management of those companies would be way ahead of me. Would they be way ahead of me? Would I be wrong to say the potential additional taxes and the price you pay for a fair rules-based system? Would, uh, would I be wrong to say the potential additional taxes are the price you pay for a relatively fair rules-based system in the USCA? Uh, but a rule doesn't cost any money. Uh, if you have a rule, you have a rule. Why does the rule cost me money? No, I, 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 don't, I don't agree with that. Capital flight is obviously a thing. It is. It is, it is a thing. 
Uh, to all the temper tantrums going on in the comments section, what do you think you're going to achieve? I haven't really seen any persuasive pushback. Okay. We'll uh, go to the next question here. If you do a follow-up, can you explain why you chose Costa Rica? I did a follow-up, did that. I take issue with some of your fundamental reasoning on free choice. I take issue. Well, okay. You essentially attribute all positive outcomes with good free choices and all negative outcomes with bad free choices. To me, this feels far too reductive. Please correct me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but becoming wealthy and successful owes to other factors that I think can be reduced simply to, that cannot be reduced simply to free choice. I would argue that timing, luck, and environment are all other important factors to one's success. Well, sure, but we're all in the same environment. I mean, if we think about the country of Canada, the country of U.S., there's an environment, and the environment is full of opportunity, as I, uh, as I described. And if you are prepared, uh, what is that? That is pastor's dictum, right? Uh, luck is when uh, 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 opportunity and preparation meet. Or I didn't say, he said luck. He said chance. Chance is when opportunity and preparation meet. Uh, and that's true. If you are prepared... Uh, uh, you will bump into opportunity, uh, giving the illusion that there was a certain element of luck to it. But there wasn't luck. You created the luck by being prepared and staying and keeping at it. So, eh. uh, now I w I'm going to say that I don't think that all bad decisions lead to bad outcomes, and I don't think that all good decisions lead to good outcomes. You could make a whole bunch of the right decisions, uh, and something just doesn't work out for you. Uh, and you give up or whatever the case is, or, you know, there's just some issue uh, that's holding you back. And you can uh, uh, make some bad decisions uh, through which you learn uh, and not to make those, those kind of decisions again. Or you make bad decisions and you find out that, you know what, there's an opportunity here to help prevent other people from making these bad decisions. That, that, that a series of bad decisions could lead to something good. So, no, I don't, I don't think that all positive outcomes are attributed to good choices and all bad outcomes are attributed to bad choices. What I'm saying and what I did say is that if you show me uh, somebody at the bottom and you want to blame the system, you only get to blame the system if you can first eliminate free choice. Did the person drop out of high school? Did the person finish high school? Does the person have an education? Did the person, does the person get up and look for a job there's a person you know like i'd have a whole bunch of questions first and if we can eliminate free choice if we can say okay the person is where they are because of not because of decisions they've made but because of impediments in the system i'll help them fight those impediments i'll say yeah you're right that is a problem i'd be wrong I, i'd be with you on that but you must first eliminate free choice um we don't seem to even have the conversation of choice we just see and 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 you know to take your argument and um use it sort of i'm going to use your argument uh, uh to sort of make my point here uh, this is precisely what the liberals do what what the modern day liberal does what the more uh what we'd call progressive wing of liberal parties do is reductive thinking Successful people must have had the advantages. Unsuccessful people must have faced disadvantages. I faced nothing but disadvantages growing up. But you don't want to hear that backstory, or at least they don't want to hear that backstory. So, you know, uh, you, you say that my argument is a little too reductive, but the tone of the conversation today is nothing but reductive. This whole idea of, of if you're successful, it's because you had all these advantages. Really? What advantages did I have? And don't say my skin pigmentation, because never once was I walking past a bank and the door opened up and somebody went, Psst, hey, get in here. What are you doing? Get in here. I've got stuff for you. Come on. Not them. No, no, just you. Come on. That never once happened to me. Never once happened to me. Uh, perhaps you covered this in your maintenance redistribution discussion. But what if I happen to be a person who takes excellent care of myself but end up getting a serious illness anyways? Uh, even if I made all the right free choices, life could still turn against me. True. 
and get cancer, become disabled, lose my job, uh, or experience other misfortune. True. Do you think this should all be covered under the maintenance redistribution, or would this be uh, straying too far down the socialist path? Well, we do have health care. I, I don't see a problem uh, with, with a publicly funded health care system if you give me the choice of a private option. If you don't give me the choice of a private option, I got a problem with that. Because now you're crowding the public health care system and making me pay for all that. Also, if we have, if we have nothing but a public health uh, system, then I should have a say about what kind of food you put in your mouth. I should have a say about how much alcohol you drink. I should have a say about the things you do that will lead to you more likely to use something that I got to pay for. I should have a say. Plain and simple. But we don't do anything to regulate that. We don't do anything to say, okay, if you buy cigarettes, you sign off on lung cancer and emphysema and all that. You sign off on this. We can't make the taxpayer pay for your negative outcomes when you are willingly doing something that is most likely to lead to those outcomes. Uh, if you're going to, uh, you know... Um, drink a, a, a bottle of vodka every single day, you sign off on health care. I, th I think, that, that, now I don't think that that's, that that's really unreasonable. If we're socializing the costs of something, uh, should we not then do something to ensure uh, that people aren't doing things that will actually accelerate the realization of those costs or increase the realization of those costs so they, they are available for people that could get cancer, right? The healthcare system is so crowded that you feel a little funny. You go to your doctor, say, I feel a little funny. Maybe an MRI would do well. You know, okay, let's call a specialist. Six months later, we get you into a specialist. You say, yeah, I'm feeling a little funny. It feels like this. It feels like that, you know. Um, and the specialist says, okay, let's book something. And six months later, you get your MRI. And a couple weeks later, you get the, the call saying, you know, if only we caught this six months ago, uh, it would have been nothing. But here you are now. Why? Because the healthcare system is crowded. Give me a private option. Give people a private option. Some people will go to the private system and it will make the free system a lot more robust and a lot better. You'll have better health care or better access to the free health care. Um, what advice would you give about strategy to a smart, intelligent person in Canada who says 20 years younger than you? Uh, they don't have the level of wealth you do now, but great potential. Uh, to earn starting from say 0.5 million right now to eventually over 2 million over the next 20 years well you will lose a significant amount of that uh, to the government and then whatever you have left over you spend it you lose another 13 percent uh, or 13 percent of what you spend will will have to be your uh, consumption tax and if you buy anything uh, that is a luxury item uh, make that 20 percent uh, and probably increased taxes in the future. So you do face you do face that hurdle. I'm assuming a large part of your relocation strategy relied heavily uh, having a business which does not rely on being geographically constrained. That's exactly it. You cannot be geographically constrained. And I presume that the first advice, create a profitable business that is flexible on location or uh, have some skill of which a company is willing to pay for uh, regardless of where, what your geography is, right? Is there a minimum wealth level up to which a person should start worrying about optimizing for location out of Canada? I don't know if they're, I don't know that I want to bring it down to some minimum wealth level. I don't think it's about wealth. I think it's, it's about income because your income is taxed. Um, there is no wealth tax yet, but <laughs> there is a bullet out there with the name wealth tax on it. Whether the NDP get to fire that gun or not is another question, but there is a bullet out there with that on it. Um, so right now, I think it's more about income tax. You don't know how punishing the tax rate can be till you start paying for it. Then you start realizing, you start looking at your income, and you see how much you have left over. You say, this, is, this can't be right. I mean, it can't be right. When you start adding up all the taxes that you pay, 
uh, it is it is uh, uh, you know more than burdensome. And if you do start living a good life, you will be called names. You will be called names. Did you take into consider the change or estimate change that could occur when AI is more prevalent? Uh, I wouldn't know in relation to what, so I can't answer that. Yeah, let's uh, do a couple more and then uh, we'll call it. I understand your example at the school of grades, but in reality, when the genius failed, the taxpayer had to go and save the situation. I didn't agree with that either. I don't agree with socializing the losses. I think if if somebody fails, they should they should suffer the burden of it. But you know, you get something called too big to fail, where their failure would create uh, a cascading effect in the system, so you almost have to save them. Yeah, that's that's the part uh, where I would, you know, if if a company is so big that it can't fail and its failure requires a public bailout. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of regulation, but I mean, there is antitrust regulation of which sometimes I'm in agreement with this antitrust regulation that look, if these two firms combine is just going to hurt consumers. If, if an entity is so large that its, its failure can take down the economy, then something must be done. And for the banks, you have a whole bunch of ratios that they now uh, must meet. But I disagree. I absolutely disagree with taxpayer money bailing out, bailing these people out. So it does happen. So does a lot of stupid stuff happen. That's my point. A lot of stupid stuff happens with taxpayer dollars. I disagree with this. But this is not uh, working against the point. This is just making my point. Governments make stupid choices. Um, but you can't, I, I think what you're trying to do here is say, well, you're a successful people, and when successful people fail, they get bailed out. Um, I, 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 I don't agree with bailouts no matter where they happen. And, and I don't think that this invalidates anything that I said. And uh, when they're being bailed out, they're not on my team. Uh, they're, and, and it's still the government making a stupid choice. They created a safety nest for themselves at the cost of the poor. Well, I wouldn't say at the cost of the poor, at the cost of everyone else. And not just the poor, at the cost of everyone else. I don't know why we have to just, you know, take the poor. I don't think what the government doing is wrong to tax uh, more from those people. In your words, this is just higher insurance premium. The government has to charge them. What happened in 2008 told us at the end, the good student can still walk away with much better lifestyle as the company only takes limited responsibility and they still get bonuses. Yeah, um, like I said, I, I disagreed with all of that. I disagreed with it then. I still disagree with public bailouts now. 